My abusive mother gets a karmic response. It took two days to destroy the life of my abusive mother. We had a long story, of course. I cut my contact with her six years ago and just disappeared. I got in contact with my niece. Let's call her Eva, who was 18, a while ago. My mother, Hope, 63, became her caregiver sometime after I left. Now, Eva lives with me and my husband. Eva chose to help her grandmother, my mother, financially, even after she moved away from her. I didn't get involved with her. As I said, that was her choice. Eva has left her cash card to Hope under one simple condition. Hope should notify her if she's going to put in or withdraw cash from her card. Hope was free to buy anything she needed with the card. The only thing she has to do is notify whether she wanted to use the card in other financial operations. Eva regularly put money on the card. She's also paid Hope's rent for a year in advance because my mother cannot afford it and could turn homeless without help. My mother effed me up when I was young and trying to help her, so I refused to get involved and my siblings refused too because of her behavior. Hope was abusing Eva's help for a while without notifying her and Eva knew about it. She wasn't okay with it, of course, but she let it slide until yesterday. It turned out that Hope gave Eva's card to a third person for free use, including putting in and withdrawing cash. Eva asked her what she was doing and why she's using her card this way without asking. Hope used her best strategy. She blamed Eva for being a jerk, saying that she had no choice. One of the things that Hope had said to her was that if Eva really did mean to help her, then she should shut up and do it without words and conditions and that Eva doesn't have a right to complain. She also said that Eva is free to betray her and leave as me and my siblings did after we used her, including one of my older brothers who hadn't even lived with her from the age of 11 and Hope never did a thing for him after that. We had a long conversation with Eva after that. I once again explained that all of this is not Eva's fault and that my mother has always been like that. I wasn't even surprised as to the answer that Eva got. I've had similar answers when I was younger. Hope hasn't changed at all. The next day, Eva told Hope that she is still waiting for an apology. She told Hope a ton of things about violation of their agreement, about her manipulations, about her not listening and not caring for people who were trying their best to support her, which is why they are leaving her all the time. She pointed out the current problem is that Hope is crossing all boundaries set and that not knowing about what is happening with her bank card could put Eva in serious trouble, especially giving the card to someone else. I've seen screenshots and after reading all of that, I believe that Eva tried her best to explain to Hope her position. All that Hope said was, I understand. You're blaming me for being a terrible person and I don't want to fight. Go away, live your life. Feel free to not care about me anymore. I'd rather be homeless than be treated like that. So now Eva has blocked her card and neither Hope nor the third person can use her. Eva will also not pay for rent anymore. So in July, Hope will need to find a place to live. Eva also called all the relatives who'd ever supported my mother. They are shocked and will never help her anymore as the things that Hope told them were completely different. But apparently, Hope's been like that from a young age. They didn't know how Hope had been treating her children and grandchildren. They thought that in her 50s, she may finally have settled down and matured. They gave Eva their full support and they advised her to run away, cut Hope off, never cross her again. They're going to stay in touch with Hope as she is their sister, but they'll never believe her again. They've also asked about me. I lived with them when I was a child, but I never called them since I turned 18, which is a different story. And I am the only person to blame. I love them, but I also didn't want to harm them. And I actually never believed they'd trust me as Hope did insane things to me and my siblings, which they didn't know about. I've got their number from Eva and I'm gonna call them this Saturday and talk it all through. Hope also befriended some of my school teachers that I was close to when I was a teen and I'm gonna find their phones and talk to them too. I do not know if this is gonna work, but I also don't want Hope to use them as no one from her family will support her anymore. I'm in a rage from all the things that she's told Eva. So in two days, Hope lost her family and her house. Yeah, not right now, but in the future for sure. I'm also going to try and make her lose her friends so she'll have no one to turn to in need. And you know what? She deserves it for the years of abuse. It took me a long time to figure out what I can do, but we are going to completely destroy her life for all that she's done. I'm not sorry for that. And I'm pretty sure right now that I'm doing the right thing. 
I don't want Eva to be as broken as I am. Well, there we go. OP, you've got to say, yeah, you've been through it before. That was your life. You know how bad it is. So, yeah, I think just great recommendations, great advice that, you, that you're giving Eva. Just make sure she gets out of there. And she sounds like an amazing person being as selfless as she is trying to help someone that just hasn't helped her at all. I mean, fair play to her. Just just what an individual she must be. But there's a limit, isn't there? Don't help someone that is kind of helpless and just doesn't want your help or just, well, not that she doesn't want it. She obviously does need it massively or she's probably going to end up homeless. But if they're not appreciative and they're just saying, no, go away, you're not doing anything for me anyway, let them see the truth. Let them work out and find out what life is like without the unbelievable financial help that they're getting. I mean, Hope clearly is just completely stupid. And I think she needs to see how stupid she really is in real terms. Bogan is as Bogan does. My smoking neighbor won't quit it on my driveway. Caution. I don't speak English. I speak Australian. Bad words and stuff. Oh, here we go. My street is usually quiet. We mostly all own our houses, except for the odd one in each street that is a rental. Due to the area improving, we don't have the usual trouble that used to occur. But there are those moments that make things annoying and unpleasant, and the new renter directly across the road from me became one of those unpleasant things that needed to be weeded out. My house is on a slight decline, living on the low side of the street. So my driveway slopes down to my garage, and from the other side, if you sat down there, you're invisible to the prying eyes of the houses on the opposite. So recently, I started finding cigarette butts around where I place my bins. No biggie. I just started tossing them into them and pondered who the frick has been smoking here. A few days go by and if I wasn't at work and on a day off cleaning in the garage, sometimes I would notice my neighbor from across the street pop up on the top end of my driveway, then turn around. This struck me as a little odd. This kept up and I just kept putting the stray butts in the bin, but it annoyed me. Why smoke here and flick them to the bin? It's less than two meters from the actual bin. So I had a chat with the wife. Had she noticed anyone doing this? Despite the obvious disturbed look she gave me, she had no clue. We knew it wasn't anyone here in my house. It's now just the two of us and eight cats and two dogs. They lack opposable thumbs to operate a lighter. So option B, set up a wireless camera with motion detection and I installed the app on my phone to alert me. This was possibly one of the better ideas for the day. I had man flu that day. Upon looking at most security cameras that were available, we settled on a Eufy, a nice little bugger, easy to set up, battery operated and lasts for ages, waterproof to boot. So I hide that little effer under the roof, pointing at the gap in the shed door, and it had just enough room to peek at the driveway and bins. Think corner of a square hole with a round peg in it, nice big gap to see through. It didn't take long to find where the butts were coming from. The next bloody day, he got caught. Brazen as frick. The idiot swaggers down my driveway, puts his butt in park on it, and lights one up less than two freaking meters from the bins. He smokes that ciggy dry and flicks it at my bins and wanders back to his nest. That brazen freaking literal sea bag. Had to do something, but I first gotta give him a chance. So the next roster day I had off, I synced it with his smoking habit and I waited for the ping from the app. Sure enough, there he was, on rinse and repeat mode. Not wanting to risk startling him and have him scatter like the cockroach he was, I went out the back door and round the side of the house and out towards the front. As I approached, he had just finished up, flicked the butt at the bins and stood up as he turned around to find me, the proverbial deer in headlights as he spotted me. Now this doesn't quite cover it, but what felt like an eternity passed after he just processed that he got busted. And he said, what the F do you want? I just asked, mate, if you're gonna do that, at least smother the butt and put it in the bin. All this bogan trash could reply was, you don't own this part of the strip, the council does, and you can't make me do anything. Thinking he's won the Olympic gold medal for being a C word, he shoves past me, walks across the road and returns to his nest. No your effer, no medal for you, game freaking on. So that camera, a Eufy, supports dumping events to an NAS network address storage. Files get time and date stamped. Every time this guy then went out to smoke, it secretly took his photo, smoking and flicking the butt at the bin. All I had to do was buy bulk Ziploc bags and just dump the butts in them and write the time and date on them. If they wanted evidence, so be it, they can have it. 
This is what I did for a year. I collected his butts, I wrote the time and date on the bag, and I showed it to the camera for authenticity. And I left. So many butts. I wanted this, he wanted this. Who was I to deny him? 365 days in a year. Could I make it that far? The box was just about full of butts and bags, and it's only day 345. It's so close, but the stench, I had to do it. So I boiled the kettle and I made a thermos of coffee. If I have to get up during the reporting of this, it's to pee. And I'm not going to do the neck bird bottle stuff. That's just gross. So I sorted through the photos on the NAS drive and started prepping for the reporting. There's actually a website called Report a Tosser. Brilliant website branding. I've used it a couple of times before and it took a few minutes to make a post last time. So I logged in and started. Each one by one of the 345 but it had to be done. One after the other, the cycle repeated. 200 to go, 100 to go, 50 on the home stretch now. Was that enough? Frick no. The image of his Olympic gold medal had to be reduced to ashes. He was not going to get away with this. Carpal tunnel be damned. It had to be done. Finally, after the last 50 were done, I felt euphoric, exhausted, and dang proud of myself. So I went to crash in bed. Or so I thought. Ping. What the frick? My phone just got an email. Ping again. Ping. F me. Is a Reddit post going viral? Ping. Oh, it's an email from reporter tosser confirming the reports. Each one individually like I did. Ping. Is this automated or is this some poor human? Sorry, whomever that was. The only casualty in the strike was meant to be my neighbor. It took a few days, but one day I got the hint that something was going down. First, he got a letterbox stuffed with mail. That's weird. The next day, some angry noises coming from the house, like real loud. It sounded like a huge blow up between him and his missus. Thankfully, someone who lived next to him called the police. That shut them up for a bit. And then the notice. What the frick? What did I do? Oh, they are sending a request for the box of butts. Okay, I post them off and I'm done with it. The final day, I thought I was having a stroke. This can't be real. I've never seen him in a freaking suit. Oh, yeah, legal. They wanted the butts and he took the go to court option. Now, on the website, it specified $250 for an individual per offense, but I had no clue to, well, 345 offenses. Well, let's just say he left for the day and didn't return, but eventually a moving truck turned up and out came the internals of the house. TV, fridge, sofa, bed, angry looking woman, crying kids. Okay, I feel a little bit bad for them, but considering who spawned them, not so much an ounce of regret. Eventually, I found out that he took a plea for community service and a whopping fine over jail time, upon which his wife left him. So, for better or worse, doesn't really mean anything, but considering what she had, it was probably for the better, and any interaction I had with her was far better than her gold medalist. But that was all I could gather. He's having to burn the candle at both ends for both the fine, community service, and child support. Godspeed, my rotten bogan. Godspeed and good riddance, you see what. Okay, let me just do some quick maths here, right? 345 offenses at $250 per offense. Now, I don't know if that's actually how that was added or if I'm taking that a little bit too literally, but go along with this. That adds up to $86,250. Now, that is quite a lot of money, even if it is in Australian dollars. $86,250 he's had to pay for smoking on your drive. Mad. So that is the equivalent of about 56,000 USD, which is absolutely mental. $56,000 for smoking or 45,000 British pounds. 45 catch. Goodness me. Sorry, I've just had a look as well. Apparently, don't be a tosser slash report a tosser. It's a government program in Australia, in in New South Wales. What the? Australians honestly do things so, so well. It's literally NSW government report a tosser. I'll put a screenshot up, up on screen so you guys know I'm, I'm telling the truth there. But this is literally a government website and it's it's called reporter tosser it's it's so unbelievable tosser is a swear word pretty much in england oh i love australia i mean look at the bottom here if you see a tosser littering from a vehicle you can report them to the nsw environment protection authority fines are from 250 dollars for an individual and 500 dollars for a corporation 
and they can be issued from your report. So there you go. $250 for an individual across 300 and whatever days it was. That's a lot of bread. Fair play, OP. Now for our next nuclear revenge post. Have an affair on my friend. Nope. A childhood friend that was the most empathetic, kind guy I've ever known. Did a hitch in the Navy, went into computers and played guitar in a band. Married a pretty mean girl that liked the idea of a big wedding and a musician husband, but had no interest in a marriage. She was her family's golden child, drop dead gorgeous and completely narcissistically spoiled. They buy land. He borrows money and has his family build their house to reduce costs. He was paying them back over time while she spent money and socialized, sometimes working a part-time job. Inside of two years, she's bored and starts an affair, or we think never stopped an affair, but gets caught. And while the empathetic guy tries to work things out, she makes false accusations of domestic abuse and files for divorce with a restraining order keeping him out of the home he and his family built with their own hands. Now, keep in mind, he's still paying his family back for the home, still ordered to pay for the land and most of the upkeep and maintenance. He's back in his chartered bedroom while his wife entertains her men in that house. With some research by the lawyer, the family still technically owned the house. Now, my family owned a heavy equipment business, including house and structural movers. When she went on vacation with her family and new boyfriend, we went in, jacked up the house, and drove off with it, repossessed. The structure wasn't covered in the court order, just the mortgage land. She had legal claim to the land, her name was on the mortgage, but the structure appeared nowhere on the deed and there was still money owed on most of the materials and the labor, so it was simply reposted. Now, the judge wasn't happy at all, but it wasn't illegal to repossess since the land mortgage was the only thing that he was court ordered to pay. She came home to foundations, pipes and wires sticking out of the ground and a trashy used yard barn with her personal possessions inside. Now, it wouldn't be nuclear revenge if it just stopped there. Since the main character has recently passed away, I can actually tell more. We had a guy we called Big Bob, and the name fits. Everyone probably knows someone that defies jail, death, is a walking demolition crew, and in fact, we called him Demolition Man for a while after the movie. Apparently, someone put huge sexual objects... This has to be censored for obvious reasons. Smeared with dried whipped cream crust in her possessions found when her dad and friends came to get the rest of her possessions out of the yard barn. There were also extreme insertions of prawn and bestiality prawn magazines, bongs shaped like phalluses, etc. Someone used her pictures in the dating magazines, pre-internet, for a paid escort with her phone number. Her parents even had to change their phone numbers a few times. Someone got those change of address cards from the post office and sent her mail around the country. Someone knew exactly when the legal separation happened and she was supposed to get her own car insurance, but she didn't get that letter. Her car burned down in her workplace parking lot a few days after the legal separation happened. And of course, she didn't get the insurance company notification in the mail, so no insurance and finally someone had intimate pictures printed man's face blacked out on flyers the printing pointed out that it wasn't her husband at the time and stuck them under windshield wipers at her family's church every place she worked all around her neighborhood cops got involved in that but they couldn't find where the flyers were printed Big Bob was an over-the-road truck driver. Everything died down when she finally agreed to let our friend buy her out on the land for a reasonable sum. So in effect, he was paying for it twice and dropped the restraining order. Less than a week after he had cleared the title, the house showed back up right where it was before. Since it was still on the steel used to move it, all we had to do was stick a truck back under it and take it back and hook it up. This was until she decided to marry a guy from a hard-working family that were doing well. She love bombs the poor, hardworking sap. He never knew what hit him. She had a bachelorette party with her pretty mean girlfriends at a local recreation league and rubbed it in that her bachelorette party was going to cost more and be better than her wedding to my friend. I think that's what cued the nuclear revenge. The flies showed up all over at his bachelor party, at his parents' house with his family, and her bachelorette party got busted for drugs when they found several people in various stages of undress including the bride-to-be 
and quite a bit of drugs and bunches of alcohol, etc. When that wedding blew up, the wedding dress from the first marriage to our friend showed up on a scarecrow with a pentagram on the front, what looked like blood, it was really paint, on it in her front yard. No one even missed the wedding dress from the first wedding until then. Every workplace, every time she dated someone seriously, etc., those flyers showed back up. She finally gained about 50 to 70 pounds and quit trying to date seriously. She looked like her 70 pound overweight mother, but 30 years earlier. She married a fat truck driver eventually. RIP, Big Bob. You are one heck of a friend and we're all going to miss you. We will sing the song of your people and raise a glass to you every time we meet. Well, RIP Big Bob indeed. It actually makes me think back to a, a story I covered recently on my channel. Obviously, Kevin in a big rig. Stories about Kevin there, the subreddit, about a, a crazy truck driver who was just an absolute idiot. But then we have truck drivers like this, Big Bob, who's an absolute legend. It restores my faith in truck drivers, that is for sure. I mean, what a man. Doing all these things and continuing to do them and not get caught. <sighs> It's legendary scenes. It really is. Okay, now for our next nuclear revenge story. Devastated teen snapped. So this isn't my story, but it's something that I still kind of turn over a lot in my head whenever I think about it. And it's been several years. So backstory. My very first year in college, I'm at a party and get to talking with an acquaintance or classmate of a friend. I was and still am a pretty personable guy. And so people tend to feel comfortable opening up around me, even if I don't know them that well. And that's exactly what happened here. We were both decently intoxicated, but this girl was definitely more drunk than I was. For whatever reason, we got onto the topic of wild or stupid things we did when we were younger. She then proceeded to tell me this story. I remember it so vividly. Her wording wasn't the most coherent due to her state, so much of this is paraphrase. So a few years prior, when she was in her mid to late teens, she had a cat. This cat was her best friend. It helped her through some very dark times in her personal life. You get the picture. Well, one day her cat unfortunately gets out, runs across the neighbor's dog as they're presumably out for a walk. The dog snaps and sadly mauls the cat to death. The dog apparently was known for displaying aggressive behaviors, but had never actually bitten anyone. And the owner was extremely defensive of it and pretty much blamed the girl because that's what happens when you have an outdoor cat or whatever. The girl is understandably completely devastated and distraught. Family either wouldn't or couldn't afford to take any sort of legal action at the time. So she decided to take matters into her own hands. The exact details are kind of hazy, but from what I could gather, she apparently blended together a bunch of ground meat with some sort of weed killer, stuffed it inside a hen carcass for good measure, waited until it was dark and threw the whole thing over the neighbor's backyard fence. Short time later, the owner is pounding on the door to her house, screaming that their dog was dead and they knew it was her that did it. She vehemently denied it. And I guess because she was both a minor at the time and there was technically no way they could prove it was her, nothing ever ended up coming of it. And she never told anyone in the neighborhood or in her family about what she'd done. I was in complete shock when she wrapped up. I left the party not long afterwards for unrelated reasons and I only saw her briefly a handful of times after that before I moved campuses. So I never really got any more info on it out of her. I don't know if she even remembers telling me the story. I've got very conflicted feelings about it. Knowing what I know about herbicide poisoning, that dog almost definitely did not die a peaceful death and the lack of even the barest shred of remorse in her voice was chilling. I'm about as pro revenge as you can get, and I can't say I haven't had some pretty effed up revenge plans in the past, but god dang, very glad I never knew her well enough to get on her bad side. Guys, get involved here. What do you think? Do you think that's too far? Personally, I have to say that I think it is. I, I really do. Listen, I hate the fact that this guy is saying that it's your fault that my dog mauled your cat to death. That's obviously horrible, and that should never happen. I mean, that, that situation where a cat gets out that happens all the time I mean, outdoor cats do that don't they that's that's literally what they do it is it isn't you know it's not the cat's fault that a dog that's clearly not trained well has mauled it to death when on a walk that is the first point and it's obviously a deeply sad thing that's happened there but to then jump to the conclusion that yes because your dog killed my cat i then get to murder your dog Personally, look, I agree with OP. I'm all for revenge. I do think that sometimes it is very legitimate. And it's one of the reasons why I like reading stories from this subreddit is because I go, 
Wow, that's very cool. I appreciate it. I think that's a bit too far. Also, you can definitely tell that she is just like kind of weird. I mean, this has definitely been on her mind for a long time, right? And, and she's thought long and hard about it. But I can picture this conversation happening. I mean, I've been in conversations like this, probably, probably not to the extent of, of this. But you know when someone's drunk and they're just telling you their deepest, darkest secrets and you're like, do you really want to be telling me this at this moment? I'm not sure, but you kind of just let them go. The fact that Opie has said that she showed no remorse throughout this is really worrying because surely if you've loved a pet animal that much, you would know the heartbreak that it, it causes losing them. I, I get it. The guy showed no remorse back to you, but do you not think that you know, killing someone else's pet who they obviously love loads as well is just like adding to the misery. I don't know. She did what she had to do, I guess. But yeah, I, I agree with OP. She is not the sort of person that I'd, I'd want to know well. I'll just say that. But yeah, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Maybe I'm being too soft. Maybe you think that she should have gone further and actually murdered not just the dog, but her neighbor and his entire family as well. Let me know your thoughts. My fiance cheated with several men, including a sex offender, so I took my revenge. I met my ex in 2012, right after I had just turned 30. I'd only dated and been with women exclusively until I came out as bisexual at 28. Let's just say the year I was 29 was a busy year making up for what I missed out on. It was mostly casual hookups. Yes, safe. And I did try dating two different guys for a few weeks, but it just never worked out or got serious. I kind of figured that I'd probably end up marrying a woman or not getting married at all because I just didn't see myself catching romantic and sexual feelings for a guy. Then I met Ryan. From the first day, it was just like the only other time in my life I'd fallen in love. Butterflies, constantly thinking about him, wanting to spend every moment with him. He fell for me hard too, and we became an item. Though he did say, while he considered my bisexuality a turn-on, as he had a thing for straight guys, it also gave him pause because of my desires for the opposite sex and his concern it may lead me astray. I thought about it and understood it was a legitimate worry, but I assured him that I couldn't even think about anyone else because I was really into him. Notes, I knew he was the one by the end of the first month and I was in love, but I wasn't going to say these things too soon and risk scaring him off. On our first date, he admitted to me that he was legally blind due to a genetic disorder and that it was progressive and eventually he would only have a sliver of his peripheral vision. He immediately said he understood if I didn't want to see him again because no other guy had wanted to date him and be his driver all of the time. I grew up with a brother in a wheelchair who never learned how to walk or talk due to misdiagnosed meningitis at six months old back in the 70s. I told him that and said that what my brother had was a severe disability. So in my perspective, his blindness had no effect on my feelings and that always being the driver was a small sacrifice just to be with him. The following years were bliss. We brought out the best in each other. My family, who was surprised but very supportive when I came out, adored Ryan and treated him like family and said that I acted happier since we'd been together. When I met him, he was working part-time in retail and had done very poorly in high school because he lost a lot of his confidence as his vision deteriorated. I told him that one thing that I did insist on was that he do something with his life because he had too much to offer and that I would help. He said that he wanted to be a teacher but didn't think someone with limited vision could teach. Nonsense. So I put him through community college for two years, then two and a half years of a local university, and finally the one year teacher certification program as required by California. I drove countless miles and paid hundreds in public transportation costs for him, never blinking an eye or complaining. We've been together for seven and a half years and were engaged to be married in October by the time he was in his last semester of his teaching certification, which involved him student teaching at his former high school with his favorite teacher from his days in school. Then the pandemic hits and schools closed. Fortunately, he'd had enough hours in the classroom that he would still qualify to be certified after the governor issued a waiver via executive order. On the third day of the stay-at-home order in March, my life crumbled when I innocently found out he had cheated on me with an ex, all because he handed his phone to me to show me something on Instagram. I accidentally fat-thumbled the back arrow when he gave it to me, taking me back to a list of all his messages. I looked and recognized the name of his ex as the second message dated a week ago. I clicked on it and my heart sank. Directions to my house, pictures, dirty talk, 
and reassuring him not to worry about me because he had my location on find my friends just in case I came home from work. I immediately started screaming, demanding to know everything, and he admitted to having his ex over twice for sex and that they didn't use protection. His ex was engaged to his girlfriend during this, adding another victim. Then he admitted to sleeping with his straight but curious recently single cousin by marriage. Okay, by marriage, but still, it's your cousin. Twice. Again, no protection. Finally, he admitted to sleeping with a supposedly straight guy he and many of my cousins went to school with, who I told Ryan I really didn't like or want them talking because I didn't trust him after what I'd read about him. Since they were never close friends, I didn't feel like this was a big sacrifice or that I was being too controlling, and I assumed that he knew why I and all my cousins felt that way, but didn't bother repeating it. The reason was, after high school at age 20, this guy was convicted of sexual assault and penetration with a foreign object against a 16-year-old girl and had gone to jail, required to register as a sex offender for life. Apparently, my ex was the only person in his graduating class that hadn't heard that news. All of this happened in my home while I was working. We spent the whole weekend crying with me asking over and over why and him repeatedly crying and saying he just didn't know and that he felt terrible. Monday comes around and anger started being as common as sadness. And I made a comment that said I was going to pull all the phone records going back the three years that AT&T kept them for a fee. Only when he heard that did he then admit to one more guy, some random named Frankie off the gay hookup app Grinder, who was the first guy he cheated with and continued to casually hook up with for nearly two years the last time being in february the month before this got outed okay so this guy isn't sorry at all realistically is he i know it's cliche but he's sorry he got caught not sorry that he did it what a disgraceful human being he told me how it started get this it was the day after his graduation with his ba in may 2018 and he was drunk from celebrating and wanted to have sex I too had been celebrating with him and said I was too drunk to perform and said I'd make it up the next day, then passed out asleep on the couch. Apparently, he was then angry horny because he downloaded Grindr, chatted with this Frankie fellow, and arranged to have sex in his car in a church parking lot across the street from our condo, which happens to be across the street from a school. This fact is important for later. All the while, I slept on the couch. How grimy is that? All the times they hooked up after that was again in my condo while I was working or visiting a friend for the night up the coast. He used to love going, but started saying he couldn't occasionally because of homework and studying. I absolutely lost it. I told him to get in the car and I drove him to his family's house so he could tell them what he did so they understood why he was moving back into their house. While he was in the house, I was in the driveway on the phone with AT&T ordering those three years worth of detailed call and text logs then i made an appointment to be screened for stis i suspended his service until he could figure out how to pay for his own dang phone then i temporarily changed all his passwords on the social media accounts he cheated with me on and to make sure he couldn't hide more evidence so only i would have access to his cloud We shared each other's passwords on his suggestions years before. I also called the bank and issued a stop payment on his final tuition check that I had sent to the certification program the week before and hadn't hit the bank yet. Before deleting his social media, except Facebook, I took screenshots of the entire Instagram conversation with his ex and mailed the conversation to his fiance, who deserved to know so she could see a doctor and get tested too. His family was very religious and had kicked him out in high school for three days when he tried to admit he was bi and only took him back in when he took it back. Needless to say, she ended it. He got kicked out. One down. Ryan came back out to the car and we went home. I took his house key and told him to say goodbye to our three pets and get packing. The entire time he packed, I studied those phone records to find out dates, times, and if there was anyone else he was leaving out. He answered every question I asked and it was then that I discovered that the sex offender and he had only had oral sex in my home and that the actual sex was in the same parking lot he screwed the Frankie guy in. The wheels started turning and the next day I walked over to the church and sure enough spotted a camera. 
I spoke to a secretary, a sweet old lady at the church, and informed them about a registered sex offender having sex in their lot, and that not only was it a violation of his parole for indecent exposure, but that he was not allowed to be that close to a school, and I provided the dates. I was in luck. They had a digital two-year loop system that started deleting day by day after it had been retained for two years. It was April 2020, and he first cheated with Frankie in May 2018, and the sex offender was in April 2019. I told them I was filing a police report and that probation would require a copy of it eventually. They said they'd saved the file and allowed me a thumb drive of both days to submit with my police report. Within a month, the sex offender was locked up again. Two down. I also filed a police report against the Frankie guy. The police said it was a relatively minor infraction, but since it was across from a school playground and skate park, they would follow up, but there would be no jail time. I researched the heck out of Frankie and I called him to confront him. He was smug and admitted to knowing about me the whole time. But what he didn't know is that I had found out he had a job that required a security clearance and he had several judgments against him and collection agencies that had been looking for him. That's the best money I ever spent on a data collection site. I didn't know why they couldn't find him and just garnish his wages, but it ends up he was Hispanic and had two last names and was a junior. Plus, he frequently went by his middle name, Francisco. Frankie for sure. So he got lost in the paperwork confusion. I sent a letter to the collection agencies providing his employer and current location and contact info and then sent a copy of the police report about misdemeanor indecent exposure for which he pled guilty and it was a fine with community service, not considered a sex crime. His wages did get garnished but only for two paychecks because the misdemeanor was enough for him to lose his security clearance and get fired three down then i contacted ryan's family on his mother's side pretending to be him from his facebook account making sure they knew he had screwed his cousin it spread through the family like wildfire and soon his cousin was contacting me because he couldn't get a hold of ryan to ask why he would expose what they did i just laughed and said you shouldn't screw your cousins especially when they're engaged and that he'd messed around in my house so now it was my turn for payback four down lastly i'd already stopped payment but since he was so close to finishing i was sure his family would bail him out and pay the university like i said indecent exposure is usually a slap on the wrist type misdemeanor however i remembered some of the paperwork he signed to be a mandated reporter that you could lose teaching certification for documented acts of moral turpitude I sent a copy of both police reports from the parking lot with still shots from the security footage, clearly showing Ryan's face to the school district that he'd been a student teacher at and a copy to the Commission on Teacher Credentials. Fifth and final down. Admittedly, I did all of this out of anger, but he shattered my sense of self-worth and made me incredibly bitter and untrusting after years of being generous and supporting him. Everywhere I looked in the town, I thought of Ryan and the cheating. I felt a terrible energy in my condo, knowing it all happened there. I stayed for nine months and watched all five of their lives self-destruct. Then I sold my condo, making a nice profit, and relocated to the PNW to start over. One thing that is sad that I found out just recently is that his ex, whose fiancé broke up with him, ended up unaliving themselves several months after I moved. It's too bad that his family was so close-minded to turn on their own son. But in the end, it isn't my fault that he cheated on his fiance by coming into my home at my fiance's invitation to cheat. Unaliving is never the answer to one's problems, and I hope the fiance he cheated on doesn't blame herself and that only his family does as they should and there we go what a start to this episode i mean goodness me going through each and every individual cheater one by one just shutting them down ruining their lives phenomenal stuff i do have to say uh yeah you know the the, the last person unaliving themselves is is a shame i agree with you though it's not your fault i mean you're allowed to do that you didn't i don't think really did anything wrong by outing the fact that he cheated that's fine. Yes, I agree. It's more on his family. And, and they have to look at themselves and, and wonder why their son did that to themselves. Yes, it's because of them and, and their, their views and their inability to accept someone for being the way they are. So apart from that, which is very sad, it was phenomenal. It really was. I mean, it went from like being so sad to so calculated 
then just the complete savagery. You did the maths pretty much on every one of these people. No one deserves to be betrayed and cheated on like you did. And a lot of the time people do tend to get away with it. Or if they're even caught, they just get broken up with or they move out and that's it. No real repercussions. But you made sure that everyone there learned their lesson. And that is the definition of nuclear. Going through them one by one and just sorting them out. So good. Okay, now moving on to the second story of nuclear revenge in this episode. My neighbor destroyed another neighbor's business because she abused kittens. So a few months back, I found my cat Gigi on the streets. He was so young, maybe a couple of months old. So I felt as if I couldn't just leave him there. He also looked extremely malnourished and it was so heartbreaking to see. Just in case he was an escape kitten, I posted flyers all over the neighborhood and on lost pet forums for my area. Absolutely no one contacted me, so I took him to the vet and registered him as my pet. Vaccinated, chipped, and neutered when he was old enough. When I first found him, I thought he was a Russian blue. He looked exactly like them, down to the face shape and eye color. As he got older, the stripes he had never faded like breeders said they would, so I abandoned the idea that he is a Russian blue. Besides, it's downright preposterous that an expensive breed of cat would be abandoned like that, right? Out of curiosity, even though he is legally my cat now, I decided to check the neighborhood watch and lost pet forums. That is when I found a post from one of my neighbors going absolutely nuclear on another neighbor, exposing her and her business. I'll call the nuclear neighbor Daisy and the total waste of air, Karen. From what I read on Daisy's post, she feeds the local strays. There's one in particular, a tabby, that liked to hang out in her lawn. Her next door neighbor, Karen, is a cat breeder, specifically for Russian blue cats. Karen hates Daisy because she feeds the strays and was worried about them ruining her business. One day, Daisy hears screaming coming from Karen's house, sounds of objects being thrown, general commotion. She stepped outside, ready to call the police, believing it to be a domestic disturbance, Instead, she watched Karen chase the tabby out of her house, smacking it with a broom and trying to kill it. They get into an argument, which prompts Daisy to write about it for the first time on the neighborhood watch. About four to five months later, there is more disturbance at Karen's house. Yelling, screaming, bumping around. Once again, Daisy steps outside to see if they need help and sees Karen angrily stomping out of her house with a box. She walks down the street a bit and Daisy discreetly follows her. Karen reaches the tiny playground in the neighborhood and throws the box into the bushes. Daisy goes to the bush and sees a bunch of kittens in the box, around the box, and in the bushes. She tries to grab them all, but a couple run off and she can't catch them. Daisy is fuming. She brings the kittens that she managed to catch home and goes to confront Karen. Karen is also mad at her blaming Daisy's feeding of the strays for losing her thousands of dollars. The tabby that hangs out around the house apparently got Karen's cat pregnant and she couldn't sell the kittens because they're not purebred and it's obvious. After their argument, Daisy takes the kittens to the vet and most have injuries, broken tails, injured ribs, etc. Once Daisy got home, she reported Karen for animal abuse and then started to expose Karen online. Everywhere she could, Daisy told people not to buy from Karen, even going onto her breeder page and exposing what she did to the kittens. From what she knows, Karen completely lost her business. Despite this, every month Daisy will post about Karen and warn people not to buy from her just in case. Now, I'm not sure if Gigi is a part of the kittens that came from that. He could very well be just a grey tabby from strays, but the timeline matches up. I'm not sure if Karen is or is going to face legal charges for the abuse she did to those kittens, but I sure dang hope so. Now, while this story might not necessarily be revenge in the normal sense, as in like human to human, uh, Daisy's not really getting revenge because nothing was necessarily done to her. It is revenge for these kittens who have been abused or just chucked out because they're not pure bread. And oh no, my cat, who I have to look after so much because they make me loads of money, when they have children had whatever with another I mean, i'm explaining this horribly by the way this is the sort of uh insight you get into me if you um if you watch and listen to the end of episodes i'm not cutting this out by the way this is staying in right there i was thinking of another way to say cats having sex with a random cat and i couldn't think about it on the fly and normally i cut this out but it's staying in my friends just for you i've been calling my sister by her full given name when she dead names my niece 
My brother's kid, who is a 22 year old woman, came out as trans on her 21st birthday about a year ago and changed her name from Lance to Lacey. Most of our family accepted it, and the ones who didn't weren't close anyway, except our sister. Eva, who is 45. We are a Native American family with a lot of creative names, and my sister's birth name is something close to Evangeline, but she decided to go by Eva after a white kid said her name was Rezd Al, i.e. a low-class or stereotypical name from an Indian reservation. She's insisted on Eva for about 35 years, and we all obliged. Now, she's regularly been calling my trans niece by her dead name, Lance, since she came out as trans, So I started calling her Evangeline, which she hates. The whole family caught on and have only been referring to her as Evangeline for about a year now and she is furious every time she comes to family events. Recently, she's been calling me by my full first name to bother me. My first name is a portmanteau hyphenation of my mum's four sisters' names. Something like Alexiana Dorothique, but wackier, wow. People have always called me AD or Lexi, or my brothers called me Dodo since he was a kid. I love my full first names, but it's cumbersome to use an eight syllable name regularly. Well, my full name caught on with family and friends. Just despite Evangeline, we have all reverted back to our full names instead of nicknames. Our dad is no longer Frank, he's Franklin. Our mum no longer Roz, she is Rosalind. Brother no longer Nate, he's Nathaniel. My sister-in-law is no longer Kate, she's Catherine, etc. This has truly driven Evangeline away, which was the plan in the first place. Lacey makes for better company, so good riddance to one trashy sister. You know what? I just despise people like this. Coming out as trans is probably one of the most courageous things you can possibly do, and it must be an extremely difficult thing for somebody to do, made even worse by people like this, who just don't accept it clearly at all, and still sadly use their dead name to probably make them question whether they even should have come out in the first place. I mean, the only thing that Lacey can do is just ignore Eva as much as she can. And I think to be fair, OP, with your help and the rest of the families, she has been able to do this. But it's just so ignorant, right? Eva knows what she's doing here. There's no doubt about it. The fact of the matter is, she clearly has an issue that Lacey's name has changed, but then she didn't have an issue calling other family members by their nicknames. Ugh, just a disgraceful person. I hope you disown her. Right, let's step things up a bit. Our next story is some phenomenal escalating revenge. Should have just let me walk away with my share. All you had to do was let me walk away. For some background, I am a practicing internal medicine physician and formerly a 50% owner in what was once a fairly successful med spa with four locations. At least until what happened below. Before anyone accuses me of breaking the law, blah, 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 don't. This has been litigated, resolved, and I won. But it is a fun story. In the beginning, my business partner and I were mere acquaintances working with a large hospitalist practice. Looking for extra income to pay off student loans, we decided to band together and open a med spa offering Botox, minor cosmetic procedures, B12 infusions, etc. And it was a huge hit, big enough for us to go full time and expand. This lasted around seven years. Beginnings of problems. My partner decides that his wife isn't enough for him and begins to step out on her. Now, this is none of my business. However, it does become my business when you embezzle money to pay for your sugar baby's gifts from our business account. Fast forward a few years and I've sat on this information because business overall was too good to walk away from. However, COVID changed things and we had to close two of our four locations. My partner has never been great with money or time management, which is why for the most part, I handled all of the back office stuff from ordering supplies to billing and payroll and so on. This comes into play later. Around six months ago, I began looking for a new position and found a new job. I didn't want to leave my partner in a hard spot, so I gave him a 90 day notice to find another partner or otherwise get his business affairs in order before I resigned. He instead used this time to siphon off more funds for his side piece and allow his unruly children to ransack my office while I was away on a family vacation and frequently not showing up to work or showing up late or super hungover, leaving me to do extra. So it was my time to go and my time to get even. Finally, the time had come to wind down my time. Per our agreement, my partner was to buy out my 50% of the practice, which we agreed would occur on the Monday of my last week. 
Basically, I'd take 50% of our liquid assets as a bank transfer. Monday, upon checking the bank account, I'd been locked out. And upon regaining access, I found that $30,000 of my half had been moved to an account I did not have access to. I had had it, and I spent the next few days plotting my revenge. Remember those back office things that I handled above? Well, all of those documents, processes, order forms, etc., they're all shared on our shared office hard drive and are absolutely vital to the practice and are way too much work for my partner to do himself in a short time. I just so happened to buy an identical model and take the original hard drive home with me. Upon plugging the hard drive in, I found a backup of his calendar, pictures and emails between him and his mistress, which I forwarded to his wife. The following day, I ran a full page ad in the local paper announcing a special holiday deal on our services, which we'd planned. Lastly, I hired some college students to write a slew of bad reviews on Google and Yelp to tank the overall ratings. The aftermath. The week after my departure, the clinic was insanely busy and quickly ran out of supplies. Since the order forms, etc. were gone, he had to turn away new and long-standing clients. My partner sued for the documents and I countersued for the $30,000 he owed me. We settled by exchanging the two. I've since heard that his wife divorced him, his mistress left him, and subsequently he has filed for bankruptcy as the clinic never recovered and his wife cleaned him out. I, on the other hand, really like my new job. Well, this is an absolute masterpiece and yeah, he deserves it. He absolutely deserves the destruction that you've put upon him and the fact that probably his life is pretty ruined right now. It's just weird because your lives were going so well. Your relationship was so good, right? As business partners and you were growing this great business. Even through COVID, managing to keep half of your sites open as a new business is extremely impressive. I mean, most businesses definitely would have just completely gone under there, but you managed to keep two out of four locations open. But no, apparently that wasn't enough. I've got to embezzle loads of money to pay off my my new women that I'm chasing and then some other stuff as well. You know, even your partner who you've grown this business with, you're willing to just hide money from, take money away from them. Yeah, disgusting. And once again, very, very deserve revenge. Okay then, let's step things up once again. Now it's time for some serious stuff. This is r slash pro revenge. Do not scheme people and talk about it in another language. They might understand it. I am a Serbian who moved to America to work for four years. I was in a smaller IT company, around 20 people, and I was highly regarded by the owners. There were two of them. Sometimes I represented them in meetings, mostly when showcasing the company's services and so on. One day, while on a break, I overheard one of the owners mentioning they had a meeting with a Serbian company and they would like me to accompany them in case there were any communication issues. I agreed. During the meeting, we forgot to mention that I was Serbian. I was introduced as an assistant, so I didn't feel the need to introduce myself. When we presented our services, they started speaking in Stravakai. Apologies if I've pronounced that wrong. A Serbian slang where words are twisted, probably thinking that if anyone had learned Serbian, they wouldn't be able to understand them. I understood every word. They were attempting to deceive the company and it was evident we weren't their first or last target. I wrote down a few things they said, translated them and showed one of the owners the translation. After the meeting, they asked if I was sure and I confirmed. Due to some procedures, we had to meet one more time. But with permission, I said, Raz milisemo o vasem predlogu, which by the way, translates as we will think about your proposal. They just froze for a second. Face white and open mouthed, they looked at each other and tried to stay cool. But you could hear in their voices, they knew they screwed up. We didn't sign anything with that company. I don't know how many times over the course of my channel's history I have seen stories similar to this. I don't know what it is with idiotic people that just don't think that other people could potentially speak their language. Like surely the fact that you are speaking your language in the country you're in tells you that there could be other people in the country you're in also speaking the same language. I mean, why even risk this? Why try and talk behind people's backs who you're trying to get money off or, you know, do business with in a situation like this? If you're going to try and scheme someone and probably don't do it, but if you're going to try, probably don't speak about scheming them to their face. Just insane. Ultimately, they've lost a lot of money. And yes, what they were doing was terrible anyway, but they could have at least made some money from it. So for them personally their idiotic screw up just 
cost them tens of thousands of dollars probably. What I do hope is that you got a big pay rise or at least a promotion because you've saved the company. Now we don't know how much money it was, but you saved the company probably a heck of a lot of money just from this one thing and being in that meeting. And also sticking your neck out and, and telling your bosses, look, I know this is weird, but this is literally what's happening right now. I'm 100% confident on it. How much money might you have saved them? I mean, we have no idea. But yeah, I hope you got a bonus at least. Okay, now that is going to do it for the, let's be honest, sort of safe, gentle stuff off this episode. The next story is crazy. It comes from Nuclear Revenge. As you can see by the title and the thumbnail, it is just mental. And uh, yeah, I hope you're prepared for it. If you're not, then, then just be prepared. Now, before we get into it, I do just want to mention something. It's a bit of an announcement, actually. A lot of you have been commenting and you've seen over the past couple of weeks or so on my channel that I've been posting pretty much only stories that are based on relationship drama, stories from r slash relationship advice, r slash relationship subreddits like that. And the reason for that is because I've just been loving those sort of posts and stories at the moment. They come from, you know, best of Redditor updates, that sort of stuff. So there's always conclusions. There's always a lot of drama, which I like. And you guys seem to be liking as well. And that is the reason why I'm covering a lot of them. Now, as you can see in this episode, we're back on, on a more normal standard subreddit for my channel, Pro Revenge and, and Revenge subreddits. But I am really enjoying the relationship stuff at the moment. So for that reason, I don't want to completely inundate you all with solely relationship drama content. So what I've done to appease myself and those of you that really like the drama stuff is I've made a new channel, Redditor Extra, where I'm going to be posting solely relationship drama stories, be that weddings, bridezillas, cheating, anything. I mean, you guys have seen over the past couple of weeks, these stories can have literally anything in them over on that channel now i've already posted one entire video episode on that channel and the reason why nobody has seen it yet and i've not told anyone yet is because i wanted to wait until you know quite a long time into a normal episode of mine to tell you guys still listening and watching right now the core audience about the channel it's a bit of a secret okay so i only want the people that are really fans of my stuff to go over there and enjoy the channel you know, don't tell people about it keep it to yourself i'll leave a link to it not even in the description it's just gonna, you know, you know I'll, I'll leave it in the description, but a few lines down. And I'll also put it on the end screen as well. But yeah, don't go talking about it loads in the comments. I just want this to be for the core fans. All right, with that being said, hopefully uh, people haven't heard that. But um, yeah, search for Redditor Extra or click the link at the end of this one. Now, let's get in to the fourth and final story of this episode. Make up rumors that I have CP and I'm a prostitute because I won't date you. Say goodbye to your new $150,000 car and hello prison and a ruined life. So first of all, let's introduce the characters. Me, an 18 year old male, unmedicated senior. Psycho incel, referred to as PI, a 16 year old boy. So for backstory, I was the only gay kid in what felt like my entire small deep south southern town and came out very young. So that identity kind of stuck. My family was mostly very supportive and I'm grateful for that because outside of two or three friends, I might as well have had a Scarlet A branded to my forehead. Eventually though, a few other people came out. One being Psycho Incel, a very wealthy, spoiled, all American entitled kid who drove a very, very expensive new car. Now, when he first came out, it was to no one's surprise, but regardless, a mutual friend was worried it would be a hard time and asked if I would befriend him and give him tips on how to get through it, etc. I, of course, said yes. Big mistake. Now, by this time, I didn't care what anyone thought because the people who mattered had already made it apparent and vice versa. So I was pretty open about the fact that I was actively dating someone much, much older than me. I don't want to hear it. That's not the point of the story. It was a wonderful, healthy relationship that my conservative, traditional dad even supported. So shut up. Fair enough. No comments from me. Not that I would comment anyway. Respect. Now, after getting coffee with Psycho Incel and being friendly, he apparently developed feelings for me. And after he confessed, I gently told him I was seeing someone and that I was very happy. This was common knowledge in our gossip-ridden high school anyhow. And that was apparently not acceptable to him and he went ballistic. In small towns, there are often what's known as junior senior wars, where the two grades have a war of harmless, albeit annoying pranks. However, our school was not completely uncivilized. So there was a group chat for both grades to discuss rules 
Limits, such as no damaging, no hitting houses if someone expressed that they weren't participating, renting, etc. Well, in that group chat with over 1,000 kids, Psycho Incel thought it would be a great time to drop bombshell number one. I had expressed that I was not participating, to not hit my house as it's rented, and so on and so forth. Cue Psycho Incel responding directly and saying, What? You can't afford to buy it with all the money you've been making being a prostitute for your 50 year old boyfriend i would like to say first off my boyfriend was nowhere near that age i saw red i love that man to death and felt a forehead vein practically hemorrhage safe to say the rumor passed through the high school and the community my coaches took me aside our extra religious teachers tormented me more and i was a pariah oh well i had acceptance to a top university my friends my boyfriend and my family i was almost done then the next rumor dropped and this is when i went nuclear one day i got a call from my friend and immediately i knew something was wrong apparently little psycho incel had decided it was a good idea to lie and tell people that i had one cheated on my boyfriend two made a video with the guy cheated with three it was with a junior someone under 18 none of which was remotely true Thankfully, he was very popular and very straight and was also an obsession of psycho incels and knew where it came from. And he agreed to, in writing, express that none of this was true and gave me copious amounts of evidence, screenshots of texts, Instagram DMs, etc. of psycho incels online harassment. I kept all of this in a file just in case this ever got out and I needed to defend myself. And thankfully, it never became more than a funny, impossible, salacious story made up about me. However, it was too late for him, as I was already very mentally unstable, and this would have ruined everything I was riding on. Now, on to the revenge, finally. So not only was Psycho Incel's car brand new, but it was a new car because he destroyed his old one and was not getting another. Love small town gossip, but also driving through someone's house is pretty conspicuous, lol. Now, I'll admit I did not come up with this. I read it in a fan fiction, but it actually worked out very well. The first thing I did was go to the furthest bait and tackle shop I could find and I bought catfish baits. Now, if you don't fish, you might not know, but catfish love the stinkiest, smelliest bait you can find and I bought a whole jar of the slop. I knew the parking lot of my school had no security or cameras because my car had already been vandalized. I did embrace the F word carved into my door with pride eventually. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. And then I got to work in the cold February morning. The first thing I did was hammer nails into three of his tires. Now, this wouldn't pop them immediately, but they would eventually each deflate at much more inconvenient places, and nails would look more accidental than if they were slashed. Then I took poison ivy and rubbed it all over the door handles of his car. Afterwards, I took a mix of gravel and Vaseline and spread it all over the windshield wipers, which would just scratch the heck out of it once he used them. My favorite, however, was using that catfish bait. Knowing enough about cars, i.e. copious googling, I figured out how to get to the AC portion and I poured in the catfish bait. Sadly, I wouldn't be able to witness this, but he wouldn't be using his AC for another month or so since it's still cold. All that time for it to rot, fester, congeal, and the first day it's warm and he decides to blast AC, his car will be filled with the fumes of a thousand rotten piles of roadkill and low tide without any idea where it's coming from or how to get rid of it. The next part of this story is honestly out of pure dumb luck, and I can't claim complete responsibility from the universe's work. However, I, being the obsessive paranoid type, would check his socials from a burner account now and again perhaps hoping to hear about his fishy car or to see if he aired out more rumors about me. One day, I found something odd. Nothing. Every single social media was gone. Out of pure curiosity, I googled his name and found something very juicy and very crazy. He was arrested in an entirely different state for attempting to impersonate a government official and bring a gun into a theme park. Safe to say that didn't fly, but also it did not get enough traction as I would like. Thus, I sent it to everyone I knew in our small town. His summer job, future college, our high school, that giant group chat of over a thousand people. Yeah, it got sent there as well. By the end of the day, he was a pariah, jobless and collegeless. 
I left my town and honestly, I haven't heard anything about him since, but I can't imagine he amounted to much being that insane and with that type of crime as well. Well, there we go. Safe to say things definitely ramped up in this episode. My word. I mean, to be honest, the first three stories were pretty chill. That last one. Wow. Uh, <laughs> goodness me. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than accusing someone of, of having or creating CP. I mean, that is just revolting. And, and to be honest, I think you should go to prison for that. I mean, you have to be arrested for that. That is such a bold, huge claim that can absolutely destroy someone's life, even if it's not true, that I think the ramifications have to be serious for the person making that claim if it is completely false and they know it's completely false and they're just doing it to, I don't know, destroy your image. To be honest though, despite all you did, which was great, it seemed that in the end, he was the one that actually pressed his own self-destruct button, right? I mean, where did that come from? The fact that he impersonated a police officer and walked into a theme park with a gun. What the heck? I mean, I did not see that coming. Just shows that this guy was absolutely insane. I think that the incel is a, is a pretty good word to describe him, let's be realistic. Although it's probably more than that. I don't really know what he was planning to do with that gun though. That is the scary thing. And based on the other stuff that we've seen him do throughout this, this story, I don't know. I'm, I'm only just kind of thankful that he was caught before anything serious happened. Aunt broke my model kit, so I took away her everything. This whole thing started exactly a year ago, but just ended. And a friend told me to post here, so off we go. I live in Turkey, and as you know, the southeast of my country was wrecked by a couple of giant earthquakes a year ago. My city was the epicenter, and while the house I lived in with my family wasn't destroyed, a lot of shelves got knocked off, and one of them was the one where I held my Gunpla kits. Now, I'm not entirely sure, guys, what that is, but I think it's some sort of anime thing, um, figurine. Now, I don't want to, you know, get that wrong. So in the comments, let me know, but yeah, some sort of figurine, toys, whatever. Out of all the kits I had, only one survived, an MG the O that was heavily customized. I built it with my grandfather who passed away a few years ago, so I was ecstatic it survived. Now, a few months after everything had calmed down, my mother called her relatives for dinner, which included Aunt B. Now, not B for female dog, her name does actually start with the letter B. She came alongside her son, who is eight and is an entitled brat. While the adults were drinking coffee, this little brat barged in my room and demanded to play with my computer. Now I refused since I was editing a video for my college society and had the camera on. Well, the brat went back crying to his mother who came and started yelling at me. While I was dealing with her, her little brat climbed on my desk, took my model kit and then immediately dropped it and stepped on it. The rest is just yelling, me swearing up and down, telling them they were going to pay for it, with her calling me a weirdo for still having toys and that she wasn't going to pay for trash. My mother at first thought about not making her pay to keep the peace, but when she realized it was a kit that I made with my late grandfather, her father, she was angrier than I was and went out for blood. We took the case to a friend of hers who is a lawyer that specializes within family cases. And they told us since my camera caught it all, we would definitely win, but it was better to just come to an agreement out of court in a settlement since it would be cheaper. I pulled out a price list of the kits I needed to make an exact replica of the one that was destroyed. And it came to just about 1000 US dollars which came to about 25 to 27,000 Turkish lira with the exchange rate. Well, she refused, so we took her to court. She pulled all kinds of BS to not pay and delay, but the judge ended up making her pay $1,650 plus an order for her to pay any border taxes on the replacement kits alongside the court and lawyer fees. It completely effed her savings, and her husband, who was already waiting for a chance to divorce her, took it. When it all ended up, she had nothing and even lost her brat's custody to her ex-husband and not only lost the down payment she had for her house, but all her savings and she didn't get alimony from her husband. Now, am I happy that her life got completely effed? No, not really. Do I feel sorry it happened? Not in the slightest. She and her crotch goblin effed around and found out it's that simple. I feel bad for her husband though. He's gonna be the one trying to make that brat into a normal person and I don't envy him in the slightest. Wow, that is definitely nuclear. From something so kind of seemingly not that bad at all. I mean, it happens. Kids destroy things. They can be horrible. We all know this. You do have to though understand the fact that, you know, it's very sad, the thing that has been destroyed and it's also very expensive as well. Surely you just pay the money back. But no, she chose not to and yeah, 
as OP said in the title, he took away her everything. Crazy. It's kind of mad how not paying damages after your kid did one thing led to her losing her house, custody, a divorce. Oh my goodness me, all her money. Oh, crazy. And having to pay back more in the end anyway. There we go. The definition of sweet nuclear revenge. Now let's get into the story from the title and thumbnail. Neighbor ruined my garden. I turned his yard into a swamp. Get ready for a wild ride, folks. This is the story of how my battle with a neighbor over my beloved garden led me to transform his pristine yard into a swamp. And in the process, I became a local legend. It all started when I moved into a new house, which came with a small but charming garden. Gardening quickly became my passion and I spent months turning that space into a blooming paradise full of flowers and a few veggies. My neighbors seemed to appreciate the view, all except one. Let's call him Grumpy Greg. Grumpy Greg was the kind of guy who took too much pride in his perfectly manicured lawn, the type that looks more like a golf course than a yard. He despised my garden, calling it untidy and an eyesore that attracted pests. I tried to reason with him, offered to keep it more contained, even suggested setting up a small fence. But no, Greg wanted it gone. One morning, I woke up to find most of my garden destroyed. Flowers uprooted, veggies trampled, and my small bird bath smashed. I knew it was Greg. No proof, but who else would it be? I was furious, heartbroken, but then inspiration struck. I remembered Greg's one true love, his flawless lawn. I did some research and found the perfect, most diabolical yet completely legal revenge. I bought hundreds of water retention crystals, the kind meant to help soil retain moisture for plants, except I wasn't planning on using them for their intended purpose. Under the cover of nights, I went to work, spreading these crystals all over Greg's precious lawn. These tiny crystals are harmless, but when they come into contact with water, they expand, holding many times their weight in water. And wouldn't you know, the forecast predicted a week of heavy rain starting the next day. The rain came and the crystals did their job too well. Greg's perfect lawn transformed into a squishy waterlogged mess. Every step taken on the grass felt like stepping on a waterbed. The lawnmower got stuck and the yard had become the neighborhood's newest swamp. Greg was livid, blaming everyone and everything for his misfortune, but he couldn't prove a thing. It took weeks for the effects to wear off, and by then, his lawn never truly recovered. In the meantime, I rebuilt my garden even better than before. Neighbors who learned about the ordeal and Greg's role in destroying my garden came to help, bringing plants, seeds, and even a new bird bath. My garden became a symbol of the community, a place where neighbors would stop by to chat and admire the flowers. As for Greg, he became a lot less grumpy, especially after I casually mentioned how unpredictable gardening can be and how it's important to have a good relationship with your neighbors. He got the message loud and clear. So that's the tale of how I turned a bully's yard into a swamp and in the process, united our little community. Sometimes a bit of creative thinking and a whole lot of water retention crystals is all it takes to stand up to a bully and come out on top. All right, there we go. Now, um, the cynic in me is saying, and guys, I wanna hear your thoughts on this, that this might not be real. I'm going to be honest. It's written almost like a movie script and I'm not entirely sure. Now, I did know this before recording and narrating this, but I wanted to hear your thoughts more generally because as I always say with stories like this, there is no way of actually knowing for real if this has happened. I mean, even if I, you know, contacted the person who wrote it and asked them for an interview, they could still lie to me. So we've got no way of knowing if this happened for real. So I can only judge it based on what we've got here. What do you think down below? Some things for me don't add up. Would you really wake up and your whole garden's been destroyed and you didn't wake up at some point during the night? I'm not sure. Can water crystals really cause that much of a, of a mess and that much damage? I'm again, not sure. Comment down below, what do you think? I mean, superficially, or at least on the surface, it's a great story of nuclear revenge, but I'm just not sure I believe it. Okay, now moving on to our next story. This one from r slash pro revenge. Landlord screwed with the wrong tenant for too long. The minor details here might not be entirely accurate, as I've no interest in a revival of this conflict on any level. I won completely, and any resurrection can only taint the experience. We'll start off by noting that I spent about two decades working in security. During that time, I worked many different types of security in many different locations. The one that matters for this story was time spent in the rental housing tribunal in a major city, as a kind of bailiff. For those not knowing what that is, think of a courtroom in a major city anyway. In a smaller town, it will probably be an event room in a hotel or community center, as you'd see on TV. 
but with less formality and an adjudicator instead of a judge. They functionally are the same thing to landlords and tenants, but they definitely aren't the same thing. This place exclusively deals with landlord and tenant disputes and is the only place to resolve said disputes. Note that I wasn't a bailiff and it wasn't a court, but these terms most accurately describe the situation and my place in it. Okay, so OP had experience here. For two years, I worked at the rental housing tribunal. It was early in my time in security. I was 18 to 20-ish. Being as it was a major city, the sheer number of cases I sat through was beyond my ability to count. I saw everything there was to see. No one is capable of surprising me with a story because I've seen them all. In detail, as a side duty of mine was to ensure that all parties had copies of all evidence being presented, I did a lot of photocopying and always read and inspected everything I copied to ensure that nothing got cut off or made illegible. By the time I stopped working there, I probably knew the way everything worked well enough to be an adjudicator myself. Well, no, obviously not, but I'm certainly in no need of a lawyer either should I ever have the need to go there. I also had intimate knowledge of how the system worked beyond the actual rules. Like, for example, adjudicators would always give a little leeway to anyone representing themselves over someone who had a lawyer, or how annoyed adjudicators would get when a party was speaking out of turn. Seriously, do not do that. Okay, so skip forward almost a decade now. I left the city and I'm in a fairly large town in the same province with the same tenant laws. I have a few roommates in a decently sized townhouse. We get along well, but there's a problem. Only I can write checks and our paydays don't line up. So I'm the one who pays the rent and I usually can't do it on the first because my roommates don't usually all pay in time. We advise the landlord we might be a day or two late, but we'll always have it by the third at the latest. They have no problem with it at all. I spoke to them myself. For about a year, this works fine. No complaints from the landlord because even if we're often a day or two late, we always pay. We're also fairly quiet and don't damage the property. Nearly model tenants. I do not actually have any idea why, but one day this changed. I suspect a different person in the company started overseeing the region. One day, suddenly, we got a summons to the rental housing tribunal, hereafter to be referred to as RHT, on the second of the month for failure to pay rents. This doesn't actually lead to a case because we paid the same day, but now we have to pay the application fee the landlord paid in order to serve the summons. I complained to the neighbor who was also the superintendent and eventually heard back that their contact at the company was now demanding first of the month, no exceptions. Well, that really didn't work for us. So we probably had to pay that fee 15 to 20 times over the next two years. I could have gone to the tribunal over it, but we were technically without our leg to stand on and I knew it. Maybe if I went enough times, I could ding them for harassment, but I didn't have time for that and my roommates don't care. After being split between us all, the fee wasn't enough of a deterrent to change our behavior, so we accepted it. Now, if this was the only issue, there wouldn't be much story though. At around the same time the rent leeway vanished, so did mandatory maintenance. I'm not gonna list everything that went wrong and wasn't fixed. You'll get a decent idea at the end. We suffered through it. We were all working too many hours at terrible pay to be able to actually do anything about it. We adapted. But after about two years, it broke. Everyone but me up and moved out for various reasons within a four month period. I'm not gonna go into any details on my roommates at all because things kind of exploded for a couple of different reasons outside of this. No reason to dig any of that up. I had been saving up for a while and was able to quit my job without having to immediately get another. So I suddenly had a lot of time. I didn't want to stay and pay the rent by myself or have to find new roommates I could live with. And with my experience in the RHT, I knew I had the landlord by the balls. So I went for them. I stopped paying rent. Annoyingly, I didn't get a summons the first month, but I did the second. So I went. With a meticulously documented plethora of evidence of failure to maintain the property and entering the property without formal notice, I had a copy of the landlord and a copy for the adjudicator. I know from experience that technically you're supposed to give the other part of the evidence before the tribunal, but I also knew about that leeway an adjudicator gives to those who represent themselves. So I didn't give the landlord the evidence until our case came up. 100% total ambush. Now they argued that they were ambushed, but the adjudicator just dismissed the case, dressed me down a little, and told me to file my own summons as I should have done. This was the petty revenge. The landlord and lawyer drove three hours to get there for nothing, worse than nothing. I filed my own summons and the big day shows up. It's been about four months of me not paying rent at this point. 
I'm prepared to if I lose, but I don't think I'm going to. The whole thing could not have gone better. I had 20 to 30 pages of evidence and 20 odd photographs. They had nothing. They had no actual defense for our water heater being out for six months or us not having a fridge for a year, just to mention two severe issues. Their entire defense rested on us being late for rent, which actually worked against them once that led to the adjudicator learning how many times we'd paid the application fee and lies that had no evidence to support them. They even talked over me a few times and I saw in the adjudicator's eyes the one time I opened my mouth to protest during their turn to speak, but I forced myself to shut up with every gram of willpower I had. So only a squeak came out and the adjudicator respected me for that. But he had no respect for the landlord. I'd won on every possible front. The only question was how much. It was more than I'd ever seen. I got nine months of free rent and the landlord was ordered to have everything fixed before the next month was over or I'd get more. I gave notice that I was leaving at the end of the eighth month and I left at the end of the ninth. Because the landlord had never renewed the lease, I didn't have to give him the three month notice the lease specified. So if you want to put a figure on it, I basically got a $13,000 judgment in my favor, adjusted for inflation and rounded. I also made the landlord and lawyer drive three hours twice only to lose. The landlord's face was so red at the end, I thought he'd have a heart attack. He didn't though. Bye Mark. Well, one thing is for sure, there is nothing worse than a bad landlord. I feel like they're just in a position of ultimate power. And a lot of the time you do hear pretty bad stories of landlords just abusing that power and taking advantage of their tenants in so many different ways. And this one, I wasn't really expecting, but this sounds awful. I mean, not having a fridge for a year is crazy. I mean, you add on top of that the fact that you didn't have hot water for six months. That's genuinely bordering on inhumane. I will say though that not all landlords are bad and you do, I think, hear about the bad ones more than you hear about the good ones. I recently moved out of a flat with my mates and the landlords were, were pretty good to be fair. They gave us a decent chunk of our deposit back, what I think was fair, and they were nice and helpful throughout our entire tenancy. But I do think that, that, that bad landlords that do stuff like this give the rest of landlords a really bad rep. However, it's great to see that you caught a very, very hefty judgment against them. Fair play to you. Now for our final story of revenge, metered on ramps. Back when metered on ramps were first installed on the main highway in my town in Oregon, the interval between lights on the ramp I used daily was 15 seconds. Cars would be backed up onto the adjacent feeder streets and you could be stuck for 15 to 20 minutes on the ramp. It took a bit of research to find out that it wasn't the city or county, but ODOT, the Oregon Department of Transportation, that controlled them. After repeated complaints and no action, I finally got the names of the two ODOT traffic engineers responsible for setting the light intervals. I made numerous voicemails and finally had one discussion, but still no fix to the issue. Well, back in the day, this happened in the early 2000s, we still had phone books and both these engineers had listed home phone numbers. So I got a four by eight piece of plywood and painted and lettered it. Are you tired of these idiotic ramp lights? Call the ODOT engineers responsible for them. Dennis M, and then OP has censored his surname, 503 and then censored the rest of the number, and Bill C censored 503, rest of the number censored, and let them know what you think. Oh my goodness me, and I can assure you guys, they were not censored on OP's piece of plywood. I am sure about that. OP said they stood with it on the side of the ramp for two days, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. The next day, I get a call from one of them, don't remember which, begging me to stop. I said, fix the freaking lights. You'll stop with the sign? They replied, fix the freaking lights. Okay. The very next day, they had a survey crew out there in the afternoon to count cars. And the day after that, the lights were reset to three seconds between cars. Bottom line, when dealing with government, until those personally responsible are held accountable in a manner that inconveniences or scares them, they will continue to abuse the public, whether from negligence, incompetence, or malice, but bring it home to them and they will grudgingly change their ways. So this is pretty much doxing before the internet was a thing, right? I mean, before doxing as we know it now was a thing, this is the, the physical version of doing it. Imagine actually having to do this, going outside, marking someone's name, phone number on a piece of plywood and just showing each and every individual car <laughs> to actually get something done. It's crazy that, that OP had to go to this length, but yeah, I guess they did and I guess it worked. I do think your last point is good. Until 
someone is actually dealing with the consequences of their stupid actions. I mean, who knows why it was set at 15 seconds when it could have been at three. It's ridiculous. They're not going to change it, sadly. And I, I imagine that you weren't the first person to complain, by the way, OP. I'm sure lots of people who, who do that route a lot of times were also doing the same thing. But yeah, until you actually went out of your way and did something about it to, to affect them personally, nothing changed. So again, fair play to you. Sister wants to walk down the aisle at my wedding. We use that to our advantage. Here I am writing this long tale on my honeymoon, but it does feel cathartic to finally type it out. And my husband is way more excited about this than the resort drinks. Anyway, this is a throwaway account because I don't have a Reddit account and my husband, the Reddit fanatic, said he doesn't want this associated with his main. As to why the Reddit guy isn't the one writing this, it's because he said, since it's my family, I should be the one with the honor of posting the story but he is looking over my shoulder to help out. So I think first it's necessary to give some background to explain how this behavior reached this level and why our responses were as they were. So ever since I could remember, my parents loved my sister more. I don't mean in subtle ways either. If my sister accused me of something, they'd believe it and punish me. If I accused her, they wouldn't believe it. Even if there was undeniable proof, they'd still give her a lesser punishment and try to find a way to scold me in tandem. My birthday cake had to be a flavor that she wanted. Hers did not. And my parents always denied knowing that I didn't like that type of cake. They always bought her a bit more than for me. We went to where she wanted, even if it was an event that should be about me. My sister grew up spoiled and didn't like me. She just used me as a punching bag. But at first, she mostly ignored me, and then it got really bad when we were young teens. I'm not sure what the cause and effects are, but she found herself with no friends, and her behavior got worse. Did her friends move? Did they ditch her because she was mean? I don't know, because we were never close, and my parents loved to boast about her achievements, but never ever mentioned any of her issues. Whereas with me, they loved to bring out any flaws of mine constantly as teasing material. I only knew she had none because we went to the same school and I noticed her no longer walking around with people. So anyway, she had no friends and I did. I actually used to be decently popular. My sister realized that and suddenly I stopped being the occasional punching bag to a hated person that she needed to take down at all times. She started accusing me of more stuff. She accused my friends of more stuff. My parents stopped allowing me to hang out with anyone. The excuses ranging from... They're not good people, according to your sister, to why are you trying to leave us? Why can't you be like your sister and enjoy family time? What saved me from complete isolation was my extended family. Most of my family lived in the same hometown, and I got along with my cousins despite some age difference. At one gathering, they invited me over to something. I don't remember what, and I sadly replied that I'm not allowed to go anywhere. When asked why, my kid self with no filter replied that it was because I wasn't allowed to have friends since my sister didn't have any. Well, that reached the adults, who apparently tore my parents apart. Later, I was scolded for lying and I was grounded, as if I had anywhere to go, for a month. But after that, they allowed me some leeway, so it was worth it. And my sister changed schools. I guess the humiliation of extended family knowing her social status was bad, she demanded to be changed. And my parents immediately obliged, even though it cost them more since the school was further away. But she made friends at the new school. However, she never went back to the previous status quo of mostly ignoring me. I guess having felt the power of how badly she could screw with me and anger that I told family she had no friends, she never let me go. My life was still bad. Her friends would come over and bully me and my parents called it light teasing. I never called friends over because my parents were awful hosts of them or my sister would accuse them of taking stuff and they'd believe it. I did become close to my cousins though since my parents never dared do any of that to family. And then I got my first boyfriend. I didn't want to bring him home at all but my parents insisted. Well, at one point we were separated and he came to find me to tell me my sister was flirting with him. By which he meant she came over with skimpy clothing batting her eyelashes really badly and started telling him how bad I was and how good she was. He was irked and ran off to find me. Of course, my sister told my parents a different tale that my boyfriend had instead tried to flirt with her, but she naturally refused since how could she do that to me? And guess who my parents believed? Now, my boyfriend wasn't perfect, but I immediately believed him for a mean reason. 
But remember that back then I was a teen and suffering from the unfair bad treatment I was very resentful and moody and now hated my sister as much as she hated me Well, that surely is fair enough. Anyway with that disclaimer out of the way Let's talk about looks. I hadn't mentioned them yet because they weren't relevant My parents were well are overweight and since they like showing love via food giving you more food buying treats etc my sister was and is also overweight whereas i was and am not in fact i've always been kind of skinny because punishment often included no treats or snacks obviously weight isn't what matters personality is though but my sister even then was already rude and spoiled even her flirting attempts were bad because she never learned to work for anything since she could demand and my parents would deliver added to that the fact that she didn't look like some sexy model even my self-conscious teen self didn't believe that my boyfriend would try and cheat on me with her ah i see anyways my parents prohibited me from dating such a horrible boy i did try to keep going in secret but it was hard and the relationship ended i did get another but again my sister accused him of flirting with her when he refused her advances again my parents believed her I tried pointing out how this happened again, but they decided that that meant I was incapable of making good choices and kept picking bad boyfriends. The relationship couldn't handle the Romeo Juliet situation and fizzled out again. I would eventually get called a S word in high school as I was fine with making out with boys and such, but refused to have relationships. Thankfully, that never got back to my sister or parents. My sister did bring one boyfriend home during all this time. He was paraded with pride and my parents spent every second telling me how good he was And why couldn't I be like my sister and find myself someone like that? Until he stopped showing up and suddenly he was a conniving insert any swear word here that tricked my sister Oh, well and the unequal treatment continued at this time. She had more spending money Her curfews were much better than mine. She was free to go anywhere at any time while I couldn't if I pointed that out my parents would say it's because she's older but when i reached that age i still didn't have the same treatment she had and when i pointed that out they deny they ever said that or claim it was because i couldn't be trusted like she was using my sister's accusations against my boyfriend and friends as proof of my bad judgments time goes by and it's time for my sister to graduate she was accepted into a college not a very well regarded one and she had no scholarship or anything Again, because only her achievements were told to me, I don't know which colleges she even tried for, so I can't say how badly she was rejected. I do know her grades were bad in school though, because whenever she got a B, we would celebrate. I would usually get good grades, but my parents refused to celebrate, claiming since I always got them, what was there to celebrate? My parents, naturally, made a lot of fanfare and told her they'd pay for everything. I was relieved she'd be going away. Not that it made my life any easier. She'd always come home every other weekend and somehow stuff kept missing from her room or some other issues she'd think of to make my life miserable. My curfews were still strict, etc. Eventually, my mum came to talk to me about my impending graduation. I'm only a year younger than my sister. She told me that since they were paying for my sister's college, they had no money to pay for mine. So, it would be better for me to start work immediately after graduation and wait until my sister finished uni to see if they could afford something for me. Oh, and if I decided to stay at home, I'd have to pay for all my stuff, part of the bills, and rents. I pointed out I could get student loans. Mum said yes, except no. That is, because they were so caring towards me and I had such bad judgment, they would decide if a college was worth my getting in debt or not. I'm not sure how they'd stop me from getting loans, but I didn't ask. Scholarships weren't mentioned. They had no idea what my grades were anymore and never believed in my capabilities. Anyway, I didn't bat an eyelid. I simply said, okay. My mum clearly didn't expect that and kept pushing. Maybe she hoped that I'd throw a tantrum so they'd have an excuse to not ever pay for my college, but I said nothing except I understood their position, thanked them for caring, and that was that. My dad later tried the same, but I also refused to be emotional. You see, after a lifetime of their terrible parenting, I never had any expectations towards my education. I knew they'd find an excuse to not pay for mine and make my life miserable. I never believed they'd eventually pay it if I worked and waited for my sister to graduate. I'd been preparing for college for a long time. I could barely go out, 
My friendships were slim, so I had a lot of time to study. And study I did because I saw college as my only chance to be free. Well, the time came and I worked my butt off and got a scholarship. Not to anywhere like Ivy League or anything like law or medical school, but it was a good enough course in a decent college with a full scholarship. Knowing my sister would hate it and try to stop me via my parents, I put my achievement on social media at the same time I told them, even forced myself to thank them in the post. Now they couldn't forbid me from going as they'd have to explain to family why not. Initially, they were even a little proud and boasting about it. And then I guess my sister got to them and they changed gears and even asked me if I was sure I wanted to go. They let slip that my sister wasn't doing well in college and since she was smarter and had better judgment than me, I'd suffer worse. I obviously stuck to my guns. They weren't happy but couldn't do anything. College was my savior and I started being happy. I still contacted my parents and visited on holidays and such, but since they refused to pay for anything, I could excuse not going a lot due to money. During this time, I avoided introducing any man to them and my sister stopped going to college. I know she didn't graduate because again, they'd have made a fanfare about it. She moved back home, paying no bills or rent, but it's different, my parents said, and started working at the same company as my mum, obviously thanks to her pulling strings. This was all sold to me as a source of pride. Oh well. Almost there, I promise. I met my husband around this time. You know those people that say, if I was in X situation, I'd have done something? My husband is the type that really does. I'm the person that is meek and a doormat in any situation and then can't sleep at night wishing I'd done something, had thought of something witty to say, etc. I'm the person that can't help but cry when I'm angry. My husband is the guy that claps back immediately. He loves drama in that he loves to resolve it. He's the guy that if he doesn't immediately reply to a slight, you better start worrying because he won't forgive and forget. He's just doing something worse for revenge. He is the one that wanted me to post there and wanted me to post on nuclear revenge as well, but decided what we did wasn't actually nuclear. People were baffled I got together with him, but just because I was incapable, thanks to my upbringing probably, of acting like him, it didn't mean I didn't like him. I love that my husband does what I can't and he treats people well as long as they do the same to him. When we discussed marriage, we decided we didn't care much about the ceremony due to our budget as we'd rather spend it on a dream trip to Europe for our honeymoon. As for where to do it, since his family was spread out and mine was still mostly concentrated in my hometown, we decided to do it there. We weren't living too far off either, so we could take some long trips during the weekends to manage stuff. Plus, there was some work flexibility so we could stay in my hometown for a bit too, if needed. We sent out the engagement announcement and the save the date for a few months later. Well, at this point, my parents naturally demanded they meet my man. I wanted to grow a spine and refuse, but I was having a hard time. The distance had made me think that maybe my parents weren't so bad. Well, my husband looked like I cancelled Christmas when I told him I would at least ensure they were never alone with him. See, he'd been getting ready for this. He even bought a high quality recorder that he could hide in a pocket to record it all. He was stoked, thinking of all the ways he could refuse my sister's advances, insult her, and then spread the recording of her attempts to my family. So off he went alone and excited to meet them and came back later euphoric. Babe, babe, you won't believe the awful stuff they wanted. Babe, we can screw them over so bad. There's so many possibilities. I was confused and I wanted to hear the recording, but he, smartly, told me it was better to listen to him first or else I'd misunderstand him. Well, he went there. And instead of the flirting, my parents and my sister sat him down. After some grumbling about not being okay with him, my judgment, etc., they proclaimed they were willing to pay for my wedding. On one condition. My sister would walk down the aisle on my wedding first in a wedding dress. Their excuses were that it wasn't okay for a younger sister to marry first, so it was only fair if my sister had at least the experience of it. At my venue, with pictures being taken and the dress, and she'd have a cake later too, etc. And now guys, Opie's husband takes over for a second, writing his parts. Hey, vengeful husband here. Hell hath no fury like a pro revenge slash instant karma slash nuclear revenge lurker when his beloved is scorned. 
That said, as much as my wife, teehee, she's my wife now, paints me as this quick-witted dude, I admit my neurons all but short-circuited when those folks legit suggested that trash. Like some sort of great freaking gift. Even Troy would rather take in the horse a second time, methinks. Alas, after my brain rebooted, I did have a whole catalogue of insults about to spew out, but something in my soul whispered in my ear like the devil. String these idiots along. So I said I needed to think, see how my wife, back then fiance, would react, and then ran out of there before I could give away my nefarious plans. Now back to me, the wife. So my husband sincerely recounted how my parents wanted even my wedding to be about my sister with a grin on his face and had the recording to prove it. I was shocked. The distance had softened how bad they treated me. And I thought even they wouldn't go this far. Thankfully, my husband insisting on the angle of revenge helped me not go to a bad headspace. We had a blast thinking out ways to screw them over this from ridiculously outlandish to what we thought was feasible. We then called his much more level-headed brother when we decided on a plan. It involved having two venue addresses, giving them the wrong one, etc. Well, level-headed brother scolded us for it. While he acknowledged he would never be able to convince us from retaliation, he at least showed us something like that would be hard to pull off. Some of our other ideas were also at danger of getting sued. So we eventually settled for the most benign plan. Act like we agreed, but then hire security and don't let her in. Obviously, if that was all, it wouldn't be pro-revenge. The rest is all mostly my husband, but he wants me to do the honors, so here goes. Just important to mention, everything he did was previously discussed with me and were our mutual ideas. He went back to my parents, said he probed and thought I wouldn't be down with it. However, he didn't see the issue and not wanting family to fall apart, would be down to helping them do it. He pointed out that I don't like conflict. So if I was surprised with it, I might not throw a tantrum in front of all the people. On the other hand, marriage is a big thing. So who knew if I'd lash out? Then he suggested a compromise. They'd help pay for stuff. This way, I would feel even more pressure to not say anything as not only would it be public, well, with our families there, and also I'd be grateful to the help they'd gave me and that would mollify me. He said my parents looked surprised, but my grown sister started skipping with joy. Literally so, like a kid. So it was accepted. Important to add, my husband also claimed that due to some bad judgment in boyfriends in the past, these words were all my idea and I'm so, so proud of using their words against them. I was distrustful and controlling and liked to check his phone and stuff to ensure he wasn't cheating on me. As such, it was imperative that nothing of this plan was ever put in any writing. For any discussion pertaining to my sister walking down the aisle before me, he'd go over to their house to talk. That is genius. And so began the months of deception, where my parents and sister thought they were tricking me and my husband and I really were milking them. How? Well, rather than pay for the wedding than lay low, of course, my parents wanted input in everything for some stuff that meant a lot to me the songs and color palette my husband would convince them to let it go to keep me in line but since we never really care for the ceremony to begin with everything else was game or so they thought what we did was thus we'd go say to check the drink and menu options we'd then accept the lowest or second lowest priced option my husband would then secretly take my sister there to also try it out then sigh and say it's a pity we don't want to abuse my parents' goodwill so we wouldn't get the best options. Cue my sister demanding my parents pay for the best. My parents would then tell me not to worry and they'd pay for the most expensive. Same was done with the photographer. For the flowers, my husband handed my sister a bouquet of the flowers we wanted, then sadly expressed how I wanted some other tasteless flowers. Cue my parents telling me they wanted us to go with said flowers and they'd pay for it. Wedding dress. We hit a minor snag here. My parents wanted me to use a hideous dress. Okay, not outright hideous, but it wasn't my style and wouldn't look that good on me. We had planned on saying yes, then simply not using it, but my mum sent me a message about it, so there'd be proof I said okay. We had to go with me refusing in text and standing my ground. My husband went over there and said he'd see what he could do. My sister suggested ruining my desired dress so I'd be forced to wear the other one. 
he pretended to agree. During all of this time, they really did keep communications outside of any text. We made sure that had happened by when my sister tried messaging my husband have me reply to her this solidified the i'm controlling and neurotic claims that my husband was making so they believed it and never risked anything in writing and maybe some people might not like the thought of their partner going around and talking badly about them to family but i'm such a doormat that the thought of being painted as this controlling and dangerous woman is extremely funny to me and i egged him on to do it I guess I have a warped sense of humor. Oh, and my sister did try to flirt with him, but he acted conflicted. Also, to really sell that he was with them, my husband would pretend to tell them things without my knowledge, but he never told them we hired security. It was really funny. My husband and I, who had sincerely considered a courthouse wedding to focus costs on our honeymoon, having this extravagant, expensive wedding, barely spending a dime. We called it back pay for emotional damages from my parents. I think that my husband, okay, he just confirmed that I'm right, was enjoying the whole tricking them more than actually planning our wedding. I didn't think it was possible to witness a guy beaming at the thought of wasting his whole Saturday doing a car trip to discuss wedding details with his in-laws, but here we are. Soon the day came. The plan that my parents, sister, and husband had come up with was wait until everyone was seated. Since the bride always comes out late, they'd have my sister arrive at that precise time to avoid me seeing her and trying to stop it and walk down the aisle. By the time that I'd heard what happened, it would be too late to do anything. As for my dress, we saved some of the leftover fabric from my dress alterations and my husband took that to my parents' place. My sister still lives with them even now and showed them as proof that he'd ruined the dress. Then he said he had to go back to me as I was raging and he needed to calm me down and he'd see them at the wedding. We made sure to keep our actual security hidden at first. As the guests and my parents arrived, all they could see was a woman with a list of names to check. Only after my parents arrived and sat down did we bring out security, a guy that looked like a bodyguard. We told him to not allow my sister in and even agreed on paying a handsome tip if he didn't reveal that we told him that. Soon the time arrived. My parents got a text that my sister was less than five minutes away, so my dad went and told people to start. My bridesmaids had been told to follow his lead beforehand, so they obeyed without checking with me. After they all went down and took their places, my dad stood up at the entrance as if waiting for me. During this, a friend not in the wedding party texted me to get ready. This is because if my husband or bridesmaids took out a phone and started texting, people might notice. This friend was in on the plan. She's my husband's friend. As willing to help stir drama as he is, I didn't care about being a bridesmaid or anything. Well, as soon as my dad took his position, the bridal song started playing. The doors open and I come in. My dad looked aghast at me being there. He tried glancing behind me, but you can't see the venue entrance from where we were, so he couldn't see what happened to my sister. And then his phone rang. I saw the caller ID and it was her. He just left me there with a mumbled, something came up. There were gasps and confusion all around. The friend in on it loudly asked what happened. I lied and in a teary voice said he told me it wasn't supposed to be me there. Now, that's not what he said, but my husband and I agreed that if he dared leave me, I should say that to make him look the worst possible. As for the tears, I wish I could just say it was my stellar acting, but no. Despite everything, a part of me didn't think he'd go as far as to abandon me there. That the sister thing wasn't true, but an elaborate joke. I don't know. I was hurt, and I still am, so I was sincerely trying not to cry. You know what? I think that's an important part of the story right there. Despite all this elaborate revenge, still, it's drummed into you in that very moment that your dad just clearly doesn't love you as much as your sister, to an unbelievable extent. And that he really is a terrible person for that. I mean, to abandon you like that on the aisle on your wedding day says a lot about him. And to be fair, it, it vindicates this entire revenge. Let's carry on. Now, that same friend then loudly went, What did he mean by it shouldn't be you? So that as many people as possible could hear and spread it. Then went, I will go and check and ran off. We decided to do this to make her create hell with the security and stop my dad from coming back and stopping the ceremony or something. At some point, my mum also left. At this point, my husband's dad quickly ran over and took my arm. He'd been forewarned that he might need to. 
watching him run desperately to me helped me smile. I walked down the aisle to whispers as people discussed what happened. Some apparently left to check too. When I reached my husband though, all was well. He made me feel better, joking my sad face was so real that I deserved an Oscar. And don't worry, he'd rake them over the coals for what they did. We got married without a hitch. My parents didn't come back. I did notice a lot of people leaving then coming back during the party, but nobody dared tell me what was happening. Someone did come and whisper in my husband's ear and he went out. He came back after a while with a thunderous expression, but whispered in my ear that he needed to go and hide somewhere before he broke character and started smiling. Well, what happened is it worked. The following is the summed account from friends, family, the security guy and my husband that I received afterwards. My sister did arrive in a wedding dress. The security refused to let her in. Per our agreement, he claimed she must be in the wrong venue because there was already a bride. And yes, we tipped him really well as promised. My dad went there and tried threatening him with police, claiming that he'd never heard of him, so he couldn't be working there. The security agreed to the police since he was hired by us and was just doing his job. My dad realized by then it would be too late and tried to demand that he let my sister in. At this point, my friend came over and started shouting and insulting my sister, asking what was going on, basically stalling. My mum soon came out and eventually other people did too. At this point, the wedding plan was bust. All my parents could do now is damage control as everyone that learned about it was aghast that they'd try and pull it and screaming and berating them. The three naturally said it wasn't a secret and then threw my husband under the bus. At this point, my husband was summoned. When he came over, he put on his best look of confusion and denied, denied, denied. To quote him, gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. He denied having ever agreed to something so ridiculous. When they insisted that he did, he demanded proof. And of course, they couldn't produce any. All text exchanges they could produce were about normal wedding decisions. My sister was scream crying and apparently sat on the floor kicking her legs like a kid. My dad looked like he'd beat my husband, but security and other people held him back. Of course, they said they had no proof because my husband told them not to text. My husband laughed and said, wow, how convenient, huh? Then again repeated, why would he ever agree to something so screwed up? He told them a new one about being awful parents, then said he wasn't going to let their stupid plans and lying get in the way of his wedding. And he went back to me. Oh, this is just working out so phenomenally well, I've got to say. No one believed them. The venue had cameras, but they refused to show me the recording as that was only for security purposes. But some people filmed parts of it. Watching my parents and sister get ripped apart by any and everyone that came out to check the drama was delicious. After years and years of being accused of stuff and not believed, to watch them have a taste was one of the best wedding gifts. My mother was crying. My dad kept changing from purple to white. My sister was still on the floor, crying and screaming. They kept insisting that my husband was in on it. But people kept asking, why would my husband agree? Why was there no proof? Why do they want my sister to do this at my wedding? And of course, they had no good answer to any of it. Eventually, they were told to leave and had no choice but to do so. My dad apparently had to drag my sister up as she refused to leave the ground. Again, people said nothing to me all night. I guess they wanted to spare me. And maybe it's because I was the bride and not just a guest for once, but it did feel like everyone was making extra effort to be nice, positive, and excited about everything. My husband says, all the expensive stuff they were eating and drinking certainly helps. We had a blast. My husband maintained the forced angry face for only a short while before breaking out in smiles again. After that, we went to the hotel to catch some sleep before going on our honeymoon. Speaking of which, my parents did try to pay for our plane tickets, but we thought that was risky as they could then try and cancel them or something. So we refused. Yeah, that's pretty sensible, I'd say. And also, I feel like you've rinsed them for enough at this point. Of course, since that whole thing, the three have tried to contact me. I've refused calls because my husband insisted on keeping a paper trail. Smart thing. My sister did eventually message me. I won't repeat it as it was very unhinged and didn't make much sense. But the important part was that she blamed me for her humiliation, called my husband a two-faced snake that fooled them for months. He wants to print that out and put it on our wall and hoped, but was also certain it would happen, 
that I'd get cheated on by him. She did also suggest that he was cheating on me with her, actually. What a thing to say. My husband took my phone, screenshotted the call logs, screenshotted my sister's message, screenshotted some messages of my parents demanding I pick up the phone and sent it all to my family group chat and sent screenshots of messages to him where they called him names and threatened him. But he kept up the you're delusional, I never agreed to anything shtick and even threatened to sue them for defamation and harassment. He wrote a message in said group chat begging my family for help as I was now being harassed by them constantly. He begged extended family to help stop them from trying to ruin my honeymoon now that they'd failed to ruin my wedding. Then finished neatly with a request that they don't share our locations to avoid my parents sending my sister over and then claiming he had somehow agreed to pretend to F her in our honeymoon suite. Wow. My family assured him they'd take care of it. And indeed, since then, we've had silence. My husband is a little disappointed that my sister didn't disobey so he could tattle again while tearing her a new butthole. We'll see if it will last. All in all, while I obviously would have preferred to have a normal, loving family at my wedding, at least for once in my life, they not only failed to ruin something meaningful to me, but I got them back. Wow, just phenomenal. I mean, what an unbelievable story. A truly wonderful plan that has just paid off so, so well. I mean, even in your deepest desires and thoughts as to, to how this could come off, you know, what could eventually happen, what could potentially go wrong, you simply cannot have thought it would have gone as well as it did there. That is genius, so well deserved, and yeah, what a piece of revenge. I think your point at the end, though, is very valid, OP. Obviously, nobody would ever want this, but given the situation and given how terrible your immediate family clearly is, this is the best solution. It really is. Having no evidence there at all, to, to prove what you and your husband did. Having the majority of your wedding paid for and having it be really nice is, is just phenomenal. And yeah, overall, you've made the best out of what is a bad situation, but that was already a given. You were born with your horrible family. Nothing you can do about that. So yeah, might as well make this situation just great. So, so good. I mean, guys, get in the comments down below. Or actually, if you're on Spotify, get in the Q&A section as well. You can still comment on Spotify. Do you think that was one of the best pieces of revenge? the most well thought out pieces of revenge that we've ever seen. I think it's got to be up there, surely. Absolutely loved it. Phenomenal stuff. I know I've said phenomenal a lot, but it really was. And now I'm saying phenomenal. That's how phenomenal it really is. Nurse said I was squeamish because I hadn't had children yet. I traumatized her by telling her about the illegal medical testing I endured as a child. This happened a couple of weeks ago. My fertility doctor ordered some blood tests for me. I am a 34 year old woman and I went to my local healthcare clinic to get them done. I have trypanophobia, a fear of needles, which I disclosed to the nurse who'd be taking my blood. I always need to warn them because I can handle myself okay for around 10 minutes or so, but if the blood draw takes too long, I'm likely to vomit and or faint. I once very embarrassingly threw up on the nurse's shoes. The nurse looks at me like they don't believe me and ask if I have children. I say no. Keep in mind that the labels for my blood tests have the word infertility in big bold letters, but whatever. The nurse goes on about how I won't be this squeamish once I have kids. I'm pretty annoyed at this point as I can already feel a bit woozy. So I say very coldly, I didn't used to be squeamish about needles as a kid, which is why the doctors in my home country volunteered me for medical testing and training. My parents got paid while I was used as a human pincushion for medical trainees. I specifically remember the day they taught students how to draw blood from my neck. The nurse turned white and proceeded to wordlessly draw the blood. Because they took so long, I ended up throwing up, which they had to clean up. Maybe next time they'll learn to listen to their patients. Wow, what a start to this subreddit. I mean, this nurse is going on about you having children when your chart has literally specified that you're infertile. Absolutely insane. I mean, to be fair, I'm appalled that they're judging you in any way at all. You're a nurse. Surely you shouldn't judge someone's health issues. That's ridiculous. But great revenge. And I hope that cleanup took a long, long time because they deserved it. So there we go. If you didn't already know, that is r slash traumatize them back. But I've got a lot more posts to come in this one. Let's get into the second. Karen said, boys will be boys. So I return the favor. More than 20 years ago, when me and my sisters were still in elementary, our mum took us to a shopping mall for clothes and groceries. A major supermarket was attached to the mall. 
After everything was over, we stopped by the bookstore where us kids picked whatever books we wanted while she was picking educational books for both of us. The bookstore was also selling some physical discs for various softwares, including games. While both of us were looking into the games we wanted, a little boy of our age came next to us, opened up one of the discs, and poked my sister in the eye. My sister immediately started to cry her eyes out, and my mum rushed over to see what was happening. She scolded the little boy after hearing what happened, to which he got upset and went to grab his Karen of a mother. Karen comes over and demands to know who yelled at her son. The two ladies began to get into a shouting match. My mum argued the kids had no reason to hurt my sister like that and should be taught better. But Karen argued, boys will be boys and that he doesn't know any better. She asked my mum, why are you overreacting? I decided enough was enough. I did a frontal kick on the kid as hard as I can, making him fall on his butt. I saw there was a nice footprint imprinted on his shirt. He began to let out the most annoying cry I've ever heard. The Karen quickly rushed over to her little turd and began shouting at me. I looked her in the eye and said, boys will be boys. Why are you overreacting? She tried to argue more. But her friend, or maybe her sister, held her back and ushered her out of the store. We went to get burgers and fries afterwards, but my mum also lectured me about how violence isn't the answer. Me being a little sprouty elementary kid didn't care and rode that hype train for weeks. You know what? I actually disagree with your mum. Sometimes I feel like violence has to be the answer, otherwise people don't learn lessons, right? And, and take that with, with a lot of context and the, the vast majority of the time, it's not the right thing to do. But I feel like once in a blue moon, sometimes it has to be done. Otherwise, no one's ever going to learn. Like there are very, very few cases, very, very few where violence should be the first response. Very, very few. But in a situation like this, where this woman is so oblivious to how heinous her children are being, spouting terrible excuses like boys will be boys. And yeah, I can imagine that this thing will continue to happen again and again because her kids aren't being parented correctly. They're not learning what's right and wrong. Perhaps this flying kick, which let's be honest, probably didn't hurt that much, will actually sort her kids out and will stop them from doing stuff like this in the future. Like it's educational. If a flying kick could ever be educational, this is it. I didn't look pretty enough four hours after my mum died. This happened a really long time ago now but I've never seen anyone run away from a situation quite so quickly. And sometimes I do wonder what the guy thought or if he learned his lesson. So my mum had been terminal and was in hospice care in our home. We knew time was limited. However, when I'm upset, the first thing to go to hell is my sleep schedule. I slept two hours that night and I hadn't been getting much more sleep than that for the few weeks preceding this but she ended up passing slightly before four the morning that this took place. So after she passed, I decided I needed caffeine to get through the day. So when the nearest gas station opened up at 8 a.m., I headed over there for some energy drinks. I likely did look a bit of a mess. It is easy to tell when I'm tired and I was wearing college merch that was much bigger than my usual size. I get out of my car and start shuffling through my clothes. I couldn't remember which gigantic pocket I'd put my wallet in. While I did that, this man pulls up to a pump in a very shiny car. I don't remember what he looked like beyond that he looked a bit like a very put together game show host. This man turns to me. He was 20 feet away, so this was all said loudly and says, it's a shame someone so pretty can't improve everyone's day with a smile. I burst out crying, ugly crying with the sobbing mouth thing and shaking. I just went from standing there hoping I hadn't left my wallet at home to bawling in a mostly empty parking lot. I did manage to yell something like, I'm sorry I'm not freaking pretty enough for you when my mum died four hours ago. The dude turned on his heels and left. Didn't pump gas, didn't go inside for coffee, didn't apologize, just got in his car and left. I was saved from standing in the parking lot sobbing by a woman who I think was jogging and heard what the man and I said to each other and the employee of the gas station, who were both very kind. Ah, oh, man, there we go. I mean, look, that is obviously the deepest story that we've we've had so far. Goodness me, I just got to say off the bat, OP, I'm so sorry to hear about your situation and, and your parents passing, but also just to be in this spot and have someone do this to you. Yeah, absolutely insane. Like, to be fair to the guy, maybe he had good intentions, but you really shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. You shouldn't be putting your nose in someone else's business especially when they have the expression that i'm sure you had which was just you know being absolutely distraught it's past the point of not smiling 
surely you looked just very, very upset. I mean, from an outlooker looking in, surely you knew that, that something had gone wrong there. You weren't just being sad or like not smiling. I don't know. I get the feeling he came in with like a positive attitude, but ultimately, yeah, terrible thing to do. Don't assume things about other people. And I hope that this guy learned his lesson. Although I say that, a good man would have just apologized and said, I'm so sorry. I, I really had good intentions. I just want people to be positive. It's my bad. I I'm so sorry for your loss and that I did that. That's my fault. But actually, no, he ran away, didn't he? He ran away like a little coward. So I take it all back. He's just a disgraceful man. There we go. I will say, though, that the people that helped you in that situation, that has restored my faith in humanity. But once again, OP, I'm so sorry. Let's move on. I was getting tampons, officer. So I got pulled over one night coming back from Walmart. I definitely deserved the ticket for speeding, but the cop was asking for too much information. It was late, I was cramping, I just wanted to be home so I could stop bleeding in my pants and eat my cookies. Of course, the typical question, do you know how fast you were going? Ah, <sighs> yes sir, 65. Where are you coming from? Okay, fair question, I guess. It is 12 a.m. Walmart, officer. What were you getting at Walmart? Um, okay, why do you need to know that? I just want to get home, my guy. But since you asked, I was getting tampons. Do you want to see them? His eyes got wide and he walked away without saying a word. He came back to give me my ticket and he couldn't make eye contact. Most expensive box of tampons I have ever bought. However, the look on that guy's face was priceless. Now, <laughs> I agree with you, OP. There's, there's questions that as a police officer, you are obviously allowed to ask and expected to ask. Uh, the one about do you know how fast you're going that's a standard question and i think that is is a reasonable one but asking what you were buying at a shop surely is just not relevant information like at all why would an officer ever need to know that to be honest i think he should have just not given you the ticket there just through embarrassment just held his hands up and said wow uh i've been completely done there i'm not gonna ticket you there you go uh, enjoy your day but no, he still gave you a ticket. What a little rat. Yeah, I get it's the law, but come on, you, you effed up there. You deserve some form of karma, surely. My kid can die if I don't. I was waiting to check in at the dentist today and some old lady started humphing and such. We we're in Florida and I'm wearing a mask. Unusual, I guess, but most people just mind their own business and leave me alone. There's a few, however, who are pains about it. She looked at me and asked why I was wearing that thing on my face. Everyone knows that the virus is gone. Why am I out and about if I'm that scared? Now, I have breast cancer and I'm not feeling great today. Mine's not terrible considering. My son, though, also has cancer and his is bad. Grade four brain cancer. Oh my goodness me, OP, I'm so sorry to hear that. I just looked at her and said, my oncologist says cancer patients need to be careful about dental care. Plus, my kid can die if I don't. She turned sheet whites and left me alone the rest of the time we were in the waiting room together. I'm pretty sure the dental hygienist who came out to get me was purposely a bit louder than normal, asking about how my son was doing. Now, this is pretty similar, I think, to the third post we had in this episode. Once again, why are you sticking your nose in someone else's business when you just don't need to be doing it? And also, what is wrong with wearing a mask? If I see someone wearing a mask out and about these days, I say fair play to them, thank you. Either you are ill and you're protecting the rest of the population from getting your illness, or you don't want to get ill yourself. Both great things. Why is that a negative thing? Oh, COVID is done now? Well, first of all, it isn't. Like my granny had COVID a couple of weeks ago uh, and the only reason she didn't have it that badly is because she's still getting vaccinated. And secondly, who cares? Let people wear masks. My wife is dead. When my son was born, I was a stay-at-home dad for the first year of his life. We also lived in New York City and I love taking him out into the city to do things. Nearly every subway ride though, I'd have some kind of encounter with a woman or group of women, usually boomers, who would say some variation of giving mum the day off or so nice to see dad's babysitting once in a while. Now, first off, it's not possible to babysit your own kid. That's called parenting. But second, I was the primary caregiver. Mum was at work. I stayed home with the boy. It got old real fast. But I found a very nice trick that shut these old biddies down real quick. Anytime someone would ask if I was babysitting or giving mum the day off, my face would fall. I'd get real quiet. And after taking a moment to compose myself, I'd say something like, my wife died during childbirth. Or... My wife is currently undergoing radiation treatment for stage four cancer. She's at a clinic in California. I haven't seen her in six months. 
Or my favorite, his mum abandoned us when he was just six weeks old. She'd been using drugs pretty heavily while she was pregnant, and so he was born addicted. I didn't hear from his mother for months after she left until one day I found out she'd overdosed and died. This little guy is all I've got left of her. But we carry on best we can. That shuts them up real quick. Now, I will say that perhaps given the, the stories we've read earlier in this episode, this might not be like the best thing to do. I think like lying about people dying in your family is maybe a little bit too much, but I completely understand why you did it, OP. And it did have the desired effect. And again, like you don't have to deal or you shouldn't have to deal with this complete and utter sexism every single day when you're just being a good dad. So if that's the best way that you thought about, you know, dealing with people like this, then I hold my hands up. There you go. I mean, if it does happen every single day, then that must get unbelievably annoying. I mean, I will say that saying that his mum abandoned us when he was just six weeks old, she'd been using drugs pretty heavily. And so he was born addicted. I mean, imagine hearing that. Like you've just said, Oh, it's so nice to see a man doing the job for once, babysitting. And then you hear the guy say that. You've got to be questioning your life at that point. Uh, yeah, it's had the desired effect. Comment on my butt at work. Let me make this uncomfortable for us both. I was working as a front end cashier for a local grocery store. It was around the time of my lunch break. So my line was closed off after this last customer. Grizzled, 60, 70 year old bearded guy. I am in my early 20s, a feminine cashier. As I finish ringing up his purchases and he goes to slide his card, the card machine doesn't work. I tell him to keep swiping until it beeps. We were mid-changed to a new sales system, so this was a common occurrence. I bend under my till to clean and organize while he's sliding his card. As I'm bent over, his card dings. Sweet, let's wrap this up so I can go eat. Instead, oh, I liked it when you did that. I'm still under the till. I roll my eyes. And then inspiration strikes. Petty, petty inspiration. I come up. Did what, sir? When you bent over, it worked. I had a confused face. Why? Well, it liked when you bent over. Why would it like that I bent over? It's a boy card. Boys like it when girls bend over. Sorry, I've got to say, this is the creepiest dude I've ever seen on Reddit. What? But why? I ask again. Well, they just do. At this point, I'm gleeful on the inside. But why? I don't understand. The old man is getting flustered. His face gets red. He mumbles. Mom, um, you're making me a little uncomfortable. I drop the dumb act. I lean forward across the check stand and look right into his eyes. And how do you think I feel when a man makes an unwanted comment on my backside while I'm at work? He is 20 shades of red, stammering. I, uh, I meant no disrespect. It was supposed to be a compliment. I put on a very stern face. Well, it was disrespectful. Please don't comment on women's bodies when they work. I'm so sorry. It won't happen again. He collects his bag and leaves without another word. Gleeful vindication. Good. Now maybe you won't go and harass other people at their freaking jobs. Well, yeah, uh, creepiest guy ever. Literally the creepiest guy ever. Well done, OP, for not just being quiet. I mean, it must be pretty like horribly uncomfortable in situations like this. And you just want to stay quiet and just say, OK, fine, I'll ring you up. Go, leave the store. But no, you did the right thing. I mean, fair play. It's very brave to do that. Courageous. Uh, I can't even imagine being in this situation. Just try and do your job and getting harassed by people 50 years older than you. I mean, by the way, brother, you got no chance anyway. What are you doing? Go home to your old people's home and just sit in your chair and do the Sudoku, my friend. And by the way, I quite like Sudokus. So that's not a slight on people that do Sudokus, but it is a slight on creeps. I served my sister-in-law a child's plate after she broke multiple heirloom china plates. I caught her breaking them on camera. My husband and I have family dinners at our house every month or so with our family. I have some sets of fine china that I like to switch out between the seasons that I've inherited from my grandmother. When we have our get togethers, I serve dinner on these plates. My mother-in-law compliments them every time. My sister-in-law, however, has made comments to me that they're not her style. I honestly didn't think twice about her comments up until this past February, when one of my plates was put in the sink, broken. I chalked it up to an accident. In April, we had another dinner. This time, my sister-in-law was carrying both her and her boyfriend's plates to the sink and accidentally dropped them both. Again, no biggie at all. In May, she broke two more plates. And in June, she broke a plate and a cup. 
At this point, I was catching on. I brought up these concerns to my husband and he brushed them off as accidents. I told my mum, and she said that she thought that my sister-in-law was doing it on purpose and she got me a camera to put in the dining room. In July, we had dinner and I had an opportunity arise. My mother-in-law, sister-in-law and her boyfriend joined us for dinner. While our plates were still on the table, my mother-in-law asked how my plants were doing and I said I'd show her. I told my husband to follow us outside so he could show her the plant that he's growing, leaving my sister-in-law alone with her boyfriend. When we came back inside, five minutes later, her plate was broken. When they left, I pulled up the camera footage. I saw her stand up when we walked out, peek around the corner, and then throw the plate on the ground. I kept this video to myself. All I'll say at this point is, are you sure she's not Greek and it's just tradition? I jest. This brings me to this past weekend. We had our family dinner and we were joined by my in-laws, my sister-in-law and her boyfriend, as well as my parents, siblings and niece. I served everyone, saving evil sister-in-law for last. I brought her food out on a child's plate with a sippy cup and got those kids silverware with the plastic handles. She looked at me confused and said, I think you mixed my plates up with your niece's plates. And I said, no. My niece is responsible enough to eat on a grown-up's plate. If you're going to act like a child in my home, I'm going to treat you like a child in my home. She tried to play coy, but I had my iPad ready and I played the video to everyone at the table. She started sobbing. She swiped the kid's plate off the table and stormed out. My in-laws both apologized and offered to pay for replacement plates, but I told them not to worry about it. Despite this, we still had a nice time. When everyone left, my husband told me I was out of line and cruel. But I told him that this has been happening for months and I've told him it was bothering me multiple times. It's Wednesday, he's still being a little cold to me and I also got a text from my sister-in-law's boyfriend asking me if I'd apologize to her because I really embarrassed her. I sent him the video again and he left me on red. My husband just called me to ask if I was taunting her boyfriend because his sister called him crying that I was. Now, somebody has asked in the comments down below, inquiring minds need to know why would she break your plates? Because she doesn't like to eat off something that's not her style? Yeah, I agree. That is one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. How can you have a style of plate that you like or dislike at someone else's house? Opie replied, I would like to know too. I'll probably never get a straight answer though. My husband apologized and now we're bouncing back and forth off of the whys and we're kind of circling around to the boyfriend. My in-laws say that's when they've noticed a behavior change. She's gotten into trouble since dating him. They act like teenagers. My husband is saying exactly what I was thinking was happening. He's trying not to blame or pin anything on her because she has been behaving differently over the past few months. She got caught shoplifting and her boyfriend also got caught stealing and went to jail. No diagnosis that I've ever known of, but the family is now saying there could be a deeper issue or possibly a substance issue. Someone else also commented, I'm glad that your husband apologized. What made him come around, if I may ask? OP said, my mother-in-law, at least I'm assuming. She texted me that they were on the phone when he was on his way home. That's my bet. I really want to talk to him about all of this, but I don't want to overwhelm him, especially because he's been a little distant. I think the whole thing is overwhelming for him. He told me his sister called him four times. I'm keeping it low key for now, but I'm going to try and get some answers about the plate breaking. All right, then there we go. Uh, Quite a long story. The good thing about r slash traumatize them back is that you do get some short fun posts. I don't know if fun's the best word there, but you know, snappy little ones that you don't have to concentrate on too much. And then you get some longer, more in-depth ones like this. I just want to know what is wrong with the plates. I really do. How can the style of a plate have that much of an effect on someone's life to the extent that they want to break them? I mean, absolutely insane. Shout out your mother-in-law, by the way. Like, what a goat saying, you know what? I know what's going on here. Here's a secret camera. Set it up. Let's watch this back together. Oh, actually, it was your mum, wasn't it? But still, I feel like your mum and your mother-in-law both did well here. Your sister-in-law, less so. I do kind of feel like your husband, though, took a lot of convincing here when she'd broken six or seven pieces of heirloom china, yet apparently, according to him, you're in the wrong for embarrassing her. Where's the logic there, my friend? I mean, yes, it's good that he's come around, but it should not have taken him that long. And now for our final r slash traumatize them back of this episode. Mother tries to spank teenager and regrets it. I'm well into being an adult today. 
And this is a story of how I stopped my mother from ever spanking me again. My mother has always been fond of physical punishment. She's a pusher, slapper, hit with random objector, and a spanker. I got spanked a lot for things I did and things that she perceived I did. She spanked me well into being a teenager as well. I was 16 or 17 at the time and my wet towel from showering was on my bed. My mother always lost her mind over not hanging a towel properly. And frankly, this was a mistake I made often. She came in while I was dressing, saw the towel, and she immediately grabbed and spun me to start spanking. I'll never know what devil took over, but it was a devil that had been needed much sooner in my life. Instead of crying out in pain, I said, and I can't quite believe I'm about to do this, guys, but I will, and I'm going to give it my all here. Oh, oh. She was confused and asked, what sort of smart ass response was that? My response was, well, after so many spankings, I was wondering when I would start to enjoy it. She looked horrified, left my room, and I called down the hallway, come back, we can take our relationship to the next level. I was never spanked again. I cannot believe I've just read that. That is obviously going to be the conclusion of this episode immediately. Well, despite the fact that I just actually cannot believe what I've just done there, um, and I'm, I'm really sorry if any family members are, are watching this or listening to this. Uh, it's probably my lowest moment in my life so far. Uh, that is the perfect example of r slash traumatize them back. Your mum now, surely, is living with that trauma. In the back of her mind, yes, she might have thought you were joking long term, but she's always going to have those lingering doubts. Did my son enjoy sexually me spanking him? Makes you think. Really, really does. What happens when neighborhood punks decide to beat up veteran son? This is actually a story my dad told me about one of his childhood friends, George, who recently passed away. Dad and George grew up in a booming city in what's now known as the Rust Belt. You were pretty much guaranteed a job at the major car plant in town. You were pretty much guaranteed a job at the plant in town as soon as you got out of high school. George was one of those people. Dad wasn't. Dad accepted a scholarship to his dream school to study engineering. During the weekends and holidays, he'd come home and hang out with his buddies, including George. One afternoon, Dad gets a phone call from Grandma. George had been jumped after work and had the metaphorical tar beaten out of him. For a while, it looked like he wasn't going to make it, but by some miracle, George pulled through. However, he was in such bad shape that he had to retire early and go on disability. While on one of his visits home, George's dad, Walter, pulls dad aside and asks him if he knows a guy named Flynn. Dad had heard that name and he was one of the local troublemakers. Dad asked Walter why and Walter revealed that there had been a wallet found by George's body which was given to him. The paramedics thought the wallet was George's. No, I have no idea why they didn't check it. Unfortunately, the city was going through financial difficulties, thanks to corruption and mismanagement, to the point that they didn't have enough money to pay their police officers during the weekends. No, I'm not kidding. From 8 p.m. Friday night to 6 a.m. Monday morning, there wasn't a single police officer on duty. Goodness me. Since the assault took place on Friday night, there wasn't much anyone could do. Dad asked Walter what he was going to do about it. Walter looked at him with a stern face and said, I take care of my own. Walter was an army vet who had served during World War II and Korea. He never spoke about his time, claiming he was a radio technician and never left the base. He never breathed a word to anyone, even George's mother, his wife. The full story never came out until after George's death, when a letter Walter had written before his death was found in George's possessions. After realizing that Flynn was one of the people who had destroyed George's life, Walter got in touch with his friends. He was a personable guy. You know the type, the kind who makes friends in five minutes. They all agreed that something had to be done. And thus, Operation George's Revenge was born. Walter and his friends began observation of Flynn and would keep tabs on him. It took several weeks, but eventually Flynn and his buddies, Mac and Zeno, were overheard bragging about the attack. Knowing who to attack, they moved to the next steps. Walter's friends, some of whom worked in high places, decided to make some phone calls to their friends in the plant where all three worked. See, these friends were union. State was a closed shop at the time. And disgusted about what happened to George, they decided to make things difficult for them. They'd remove vital tools for emergency maintenance at the last minute. 
put them in positions they weren't good in and rearranged the schedule so they got the worst shifts to name just a few they also began a whispering campaign so everyone at the plant knew what had happened in this city back then who you knew and what everyone thought you've done was enough to make or break you the goal was to get them to quit and after a year or so all three had frustrated with how they were being treated but walter and his friends aren't done not by a long shot a few phone calls and anonymous letters later flynn mac and zeno were unemployable in the district because they hadn't been fired they weren't entitled to severance or anything soon their money ran out but they couldn't get out of town because everyone knew from the whispering campaign what they'd done to george for the rest of their lives walter and his friends kept an eye on flynn mac and zeno just when it appeared that they had an out the whisper slash letter campaign would start again and they'd be denied an out the three men ended up homeless and destitute alcoholics who couldn't even get state aid and this in a state that is known for its generous aid for those in bad straits walter and his friends made a contingency plan to continue this until the three men were dead using the next generation so those men would never forget what they did to george nobody was able to find out anything about flynn mac and zeno but i wouldn't be surprised if they're still stuck and miserable wow there we go what a start to the episode the best revenge in my opinion is revenge that just ruins someone's lives i say that in a semi-sarcastic way but ultimately when it comes down to something like this in which somebody out there has ruined someone's lives do they not deserve it back on them a little bit i think they might before reading this i thought this was going to be a one-off sort of friendly visit vibe where you know they go and just completely f him up but no this was so much better i mean flynn mac and Zena, I, I, it sounds hot i mean is it too far personally i don't think so let me know in the comments down below your thoughts but uh yeah very very justified revenge that lasted a lifetime and hey still might be continuing phenomenal now our next revenge story comes from art slash pro revenge and it does need a little bit of explaining over two years ago now i read out a story titled hell hath no fury like me scored it's one of the best posts that i've read from r slash pro revenge if you guys don't remember it don't worry there is a little recap coming at the start of this update but i'm gonna leave a link to the original story well me narrating it down below in the description so if you do want to check that out first or you you start listening to this and you're not entirely sure what's going on and you want to hear that click it it will explain everything but for now let's get in to part two of this one as i said over two years later okay so here we go hello r slash pro revenge a couple of years ago i posted a revenge story involving my stepmother shanty wife my stepbrother shorty and my dad who is now resting in a purple urn in case you missed it you can read it here again link down below if you want to hear me narrate it well op finally has an update to recap shorty my stepbrother was my dad's power of attorney while he was sick and had heinously abused his position stealing a very large sum of money when i got involved i got a restraining order against shorty filed charges took over my dad's care and exacted some sweet revenge in the process i was warned by the court's victim's advocate who is my first cousin because that's how it is in that town that bringing shorty to trial for what he did would take a very long time she was correct in the meantime i monitored shorty's online activities when he moved out of state i called the court and let them know just in case it violated his bail when he got a job as a truck driver i called the court to let them know he was repeatedly leaving his home state just in case it violated his bail then six months ago i got a call from the same victim's advocate the trial was going to be set soon and the court wanted family input regarding possible plea deals and sentencing he was indicted on felony elder abuse and was facing 15 years in prison the advocate let me know that the family could request prison time or plea him down to work release with restitution the upside to prison was obvious but the downside would be that we would not likely receive restitution since he'd be perpetually poor and in prison with work release we would receive restitution but he would have his freedom somewhat she wanted to know which we preferred i asked for the night to think it over shorty's future rested in my hands and i wanted to savor it what kind of god did i want to be to decide i needed to do some maths if he went to prison for 15 years he'd be out in half or less now seven years is a long time but restitution would surely take as long if not longer and i would get the pleasure of taking his money every month 
for years and years and years. I like the thought of him working every day, toiling away in terrible conditions for terrible pay and him knowing that a portion of that terrible day would be for nothing. I loved the thought that I would be the reason for it. So I called her back and told her we would be okay with a plea deal to felony supervised release and restitution. I didn't hear anything further until last week when the advocate called me again to let me know he'd accepted a deal. The deal. He pled guilty to felony elder exploitation, first degree. He received 15 years, split and suspended, which means he won't serve any jail time. Two years will be on felony work supervision, where he'll have to call into his parole officer every day and be drug tested almost as frequently. After that, he'll be on regular probation for up to five years. The judge will schedule check-ins with him to ensure he's paying restitution and meeting the requirements of his work release and parole. So what is the restitution? Well, he has to pay back $130,539.39. He was ordered to pay $300 a month beginning 1st of the 1st, 2024. My math gamble paid off. It will take him 36 years to pay that back at $300 a month. If he misses a payment, he will go to jail. I will be in his life for decades, taking back from him bit by bit what he stole. That's unbelievable. So I think that's going to be it. I've done everything I can do, apart from being there to catch him if he violates the terms of his release. Thank you for reading this tangled web of revenge. I hope it warms your heart for the holidays. Well, that right there, guys, is genuinely a Christmas miracle. I mean, not just the fact that it's a phenomenal story, but that update is just so good. I mean, how many times, right, have have people said, written, at the bottom of their post on reddit i'll update you guys if i get any further news or if things happen etc etc and obviously they must right at some point i mean things must happen in continuations of stories where things have been said are gonna you know they're waiting for this or this is gonna happen in the future whatever but it's so rare that we actually get an update first of all and then when you do get an update a lot of the time it's uh you know it didn't work out the way i wanted or it didn't actually happen or kind of fizzled out into nothing this is unbelievable though i mean yeah the the initial post was great and again if you haven't already seen that link down below but this i mean what an update he's paying this back for 36 years 36 years phenomenal with every single payment you op are gonna be in his mind i mean that is just phenomenal justice yeah he avoids prison but as you said throughout this you think it's probably better or I guess more taxing on him to to go through it this way. And yeah, good gamble. It paid off. If he went to prison for seven years, that is one thing. Terrible. But this is 36 years of of pain. (sighs) Just unbelievable. Right, good news is we do have time for one more story in this episode. This one actually comes from Petty Revenge. So we've gone from nuclear to pro to petty. Comment down below. Which subreddit do you prefer the most? Let's get in to this story. Use my email as your spam dump. Prepare to be carpet bombed. One day, many years ago, I got an email addressed to someone who had the same first initial and last name as I do. For the purpose of this story, I'll call him G-Man. As with anyone who uses a common email address, think first initial and last name, you do sometimes get an email that isn't meant for you. It was mostly incidental things like receipts and the occasional personal email. I was chalking them up to being a data entry error. Perhaps they misheard the email address and instead of typing in gclastname at gmail.com, they typed in glastname at gmail.com. No big deal. In the cases where I could, I politely replied to the sender and let them know that I wasn't the intended recipient and to please let Gman know that he's giving out the wrong email address going forward. It was never successful. I'd still get emails for G-Man and it was for things that I'd think you'd want to receive, like order receipts or something that had a confirmation number attached to it. I tried to track down G-Man, but to no avail. There were multiple G-Man last name on social media, so I could never 100% confirm which one it might have been. And so this went on and on for years until finally one day I got a personal email addressed to G-Man that referenced the company he worked for. Aha, now I had something. I looked him up. It turns out that G-Man is the systems manager at said company. His LinkedIn bio says that he is an IT professional. Well, that's interesting. I found his company email and forwarded him the email, also advising him that the other address he's using is attached to another person, and it would be great if he could be more mindful of what he's typing in or giving out. Again, I was polite in my request to him. 
He replied and apologized. And I thought, it's finally over. But it wasn't over. Oh no, far from it. The emails I received that were addressed to G-Man actually began to increase in volume. Now I'm getting emails for mailing lists and account signups and all sorts of other rubbish. This guy, the so-called IT professional, is clearly using my email address as his spam dump knowing that it went to an actual person. I would have to sort through dozens upon dozens upon dozens of emails daily as a result of this. And as we all know, once you're on one mailing list, you tend to end up on a lot more mailing lists. By now, I've decided that clearly this clown is deliberately being a jerk. So it's gloves off and game on. I decide to extract revenge at any opportunity. It started out simple enough. If I got an account sign up, I'd click the link to verify it and then promptly log in and deactivate the account. It worked for a bit, but then there'd be another sign up. So I got more creative. I'd log into the account, change all the information and most importantly, the password, usually to something like I am a gigantic butthole, which would leave the account active, but totally inaccessible since any attempt at password recovery sent the email to my account which was then promptly ignored and deleted. Hotel booking? I'd log on and cancel it the day before he was due to arrive. I'm guessing he never got noticed though, since it was all coming to my email. Basically anything I could do that would inconvenience G-Man, I would do it. This back and forth continued on for years. In fact, I still occasionally get emails for the guy. Then one day it happened. I got an email receipt for an order that G-Man had placed. It had the recipient's name and address, but more importantly, it had G-Man's address on it. Queue up, I've got a golden ticket. I finally had the means of the ultimate revenge. I took his address and signed him up for everything I could find. Free samples, i.e. adult diapers, feminine products and lube, catalogs, normal, not so normal, and then also raunchy. I spent an entire day finding anything I could enter his address into, and I dutifully filled it out. But the coup de grace, the cherry on top. When I was finding things to sign up for, I stumbled onto a website that allowed you to order free flooring samples. They'd be various sizes, but some were 12 foot by 12 foot squares. Carpet, tile, wood, linoleum, whatever. I signed G-Man up for every sample I could. Then I found another site offering the same thing and I did it again and again and again until the point where I literally lost track of how many free flooring samples I signed him up for. My guess, easily in the hundreds, if not the thousands. So, I literally carpet bombed G-Man. Oh, it all makes sense now. Coincidentally, the email volume certainly decreased. I never heard from G-Man either. Maybe he deleted my initial email and forgot, or maybe he was buried under all those flooring samples. Either way, I'm sure once they started to arrive, he realized his mistake. I bet that to this day, he still gets items delivered to that address. The one thing I can't get over with this story, and it's phenomenal by the way, once again, like these three revenges have been so good. But how stupid do you have to be to actually use someone else's email or some like spam email anyway for things that actually matter? I mean, if you're getting confirmations and you're getting emails sent to you, and going through that email address and, and you know the link that you get sent to your email can cancel a really important thing like a hotel booking or you're getting confirmation statements and receipts and that sort of stuff that you, that you need to keep a hold of. Why are you having that sent to an email that you don't have access to? That's what I don't understand. That is the dumbest part of all of this. Now, that is one thing. The revenge though is just phenomenal and OP, I'm sorry you were caught up in this, but wow, what a way to just destroy someone's life. Imagine you come back from work and oh, you're like, God, more tiles as you just see your front door piled with stuff. It'd be terrible. I feel like any normal person would have very quickly realized, I mean, definitely when you got this email from OP that was saying, by the way, you're using the wrong email address, please stop. To stop doing that and actually start using an email address that you'd want to use. But G-Man is G-Man and that was some petty revenge. Today I effed up by being a jerk on the internet and causing a stranger to get divorced. I'm cross posting this from the subreddit today. I effed up. I'm really not a mean person and I genuinely felt terrible for destroying a marriage, but the lovely users over there thought I should post here, though I didn't mean for the revenge to go to this level by any means. 
I don't even know if I meant for revenge at all, but here we are. So, I, a 42-year-old woman, effed up big time. Two weeks ago, on a random Thursday morning at like 1am, someone started shooting off fireworks in my neighborhood. I'd been having bouts of insomnia and was finally able to get to sleep. And I had to wake up at 4am for a meeting two hours away that I had to be at for 8am. I was fuming and so were my dogs. I love fireworks, but I think there's a time and a place. Thursday morning at 1am is not it. I posted to the neighborhood Facebook group a few hours later during a coffee break about people that set off fireworks at 1am midweek. After I make the long drive home, I check my Facebook. Some guy comments that I can't sleep because I'm a fat pig. Now I'm chubby, but not sloppy fat. Plus, I just lost the equivalent of a fully grown male wombat or 54 North American gray squirrels. So I feel freaking awesome about myself. Now, this is where I may have really effed up. I respond to the guy who was maybe mid to late 30s or very early 40s, about the same age group as me. I write in a comment beneath his, listen, guy's name. I'm sorry I had to end things, but I just didn't have the same feelings. What you're saying now is just hurtful and mean. Please stop sending me messages and commenting on my Facebook posts. It's just a pathetic way to contact me. I told you a dozen times already. We are done. It's over. The following day, I had to get to the airport for an out of country vacation that had me getting up early and leaving early as heck. So I don't check my Facebook during all the craziness. Also because I'm only on it sparingly. I don't live on my phone and when I am, I'm usually on Reddit or TikTok versus Facebook. I couldn't check my Facebook even if I wanted to. I was on a cruise and I'm not paying $25 a day for internet and the country we visited didn't really have the greatest Wi-Fi. Besides, I was having a blast leaving the chaos of the world behind. I signed back in on Monday night and frick. Apparently, people took my message seriously and they told his wife. She was freaking out at me, pleading for information. She sent me messages. Her and his friends were DMing me. He was DMing me. It was bad. The last message was the guy saying I'm a total C word because I refused to tell the truth and I just destroyed his life. I immediately messaged both him and his wife explaining what happened. I sent pics of me on vacation even. Timestamps. Apparently, he is a serial cheater. And when I exposed our affair, another woman exposed her affair with the husband to the wife because she was jealous that he had yet another side chick. This was the straw that broke the camel's back because not only are there multiple affairs, but because he humiliated her with how public this was especially me putting this in a facebook neighborhood group so there is my accidental pro revenge well there we go what a story to kick things off i've got to say although it was accidental was it justified 100 percent, yes in my opinion like this guy is an absolute disgrace i'm sorry not only because of his just online abuse i mean why is he calling you a fat pig on facebook just ridiculous but also because he is a serial cheater anyway So although you probably didn't realize that when you said these things, ultimately, is it a bad thing that you kind of expose his cheating? I would say no. And if people realize that he is a cheater because of what you said, it doesn't matter if you're lying. You got to the truth. Like realistically, this probably would have ended in divorce, this relationship down the line at some point. It just seems pretty obvious that that was kind of a guarantee. So in doing this, in exposing this man, doesn't matter if it was accidental or not, You are saving, first of all, the woman that he is with, a lot of years probably, of of wasted time. And then also the person that he's having an affair with anyway a lot of time because maybe she didn't know, maybe she did know anyway and there's also a terrible person. It's less about her, I would say, and more about his wife, saving her a lot of years because at least now she knows what's going on and can move on. Wow, accidentally causing a divorce. Fair play. Now moving on to our second story of revenge. Boss from hell gets what she deserves. I am a woman in my 30s and I've been a people pleaser to a fault my whole life. I've been working in marketing for over 10 years. And over the years, I've had my fair share of bosses who were good, average, and some who sucked. There is one in particular that stood out as awful. This story is from about five years ago. Pamela, in her 40s, not her real name, was the VP of marketing and sales for a mid-sized retailer. 
she started at the company a few years after i did and if rumors were true she was the fourth pick for the position and was simply hired so the company could appease shareholders i was a manager under her and my whole job was to make sure the website and stores had their products merchandised properly received all their monthly sales materials managed advertising set up and managed the department's budget pm'd all department projects and operations created reporting through reflex sales managed presentations slash creative briefs for future projects etc in short i did her work and all the administrative grunt work to keep the department afloat i managed all of this because i had access to her email and many times sent emails on her behalf to keep the department functioning Pamela spent most of her time showing up after 10 a.m., taking business lunches, and planning company parties. I don't even know why we did those, but I planned those too. I consistently questioned why she spent so much of our budget on these events when we didn't have the budget resources for any of it. Pamela told me to take from future months' budgets to pay for the current months overspending. So at the start of every month, I had an original budget, and by the end of the month, I had to turn in an edited budget edited under pamela's direction that made it look like pamela's spending was under control this is important for later i definitely made mistakes here and there being in charge of so many tasks and constantly found myself working 12 hour days split between being in the office and working after my kid went to bed weekend work was also done before my family woke up and then after they went to bed my word during pamela's first major holiday season sales were awful Pamela kept changing her mind on the visuals for the stores, kept bringing on new advertising and PR agencies to bring in sales. All these agencies consisted of her personal friends and ignored our buying and merchandise team's planned promotions for her own better ones. At this time, I'd been dealing with an ongoing infection that turned to sepsis and was hospitalized. The doctors and my husband said it was due to the stress of work and that I needed to take a break. As I recovered, I realized how much I was hurting myself, my family, and even the company I work for. Eventually, my old habits got to me and I got on my phone and checked mine and my boss's emails. What I found made my blood boil. First, I got a lovely bouquet of flowers from upper management wishing me well. And I knew that Pamela organized the delivery. She sent me her favorite flowers. I went to her inbox to put the receipt in the correct folder to send to accounting when I got back. And at the top of her inbox from the past three days were emails clearly not related to business. What I found in her emails was Pamela emailing her personal friends, grabbing about how I can't just shake off sepsis and get back to work. She also complained that she couldn't find any of my notes, spreadsheets or documents for any of the work she was technically in charge of they were on our share drive labeled very clearly finally i found an email she sent a friend from a previous company asking for advice on how to bring in sales and save her job in this long thread this old colleague asked if there was anyone managing most of the work and of course pamela said i was this colleague explained that clearly it was my mismanagement that was causing issues and that I could be blamed if sales didn't pull through by the end of the season. Pamela mentioned that I was in hospital and repeated comments from her other email thread. This person said that she couldn't outright fire me because it could seem like retaliation as I needed to take emergency medical leave. But if Pamela could prove I was stealing from the company or misusing company resources, then she would have grounds to have me fired and then use me as a scapegoat. Upon my return, Pamela called me into her office and said she was worried I was taking on too much and wanted to take work off my plate. She announced that she was taking managing the department budget off my plate. She asked me to only drop off a small stack of invoices to accounting. Additionally, Pamela told me that under no circumstances was I allowed to talk to accounting about anything regarding budgets. Also, if I had any concerns about the department or workload, I wasn't allowed to go to HR. I had to discuss it directly with her. Oh, yeah, I could see where this was going. Unfortunately for Pamela, I had built a rapport with Lois, who was our main accountant. Lois always said that she would do everything in her power to help me, should I ask. Knowing this, I grabbed the stack of invoices off Pamela's desk to give to accounting. I also added the email threads that I read while I was in the hospital and the current unedited budget that Pamela hadn't touched yet for the month. 
I also found in my filing cabinet the hard copies of old budgets with Pamela's handwriting on what numbers to change to balance our budget. Finally, I added an email from our first round of budget adjustments where Pamela subtly threatened to put someone else in my job if I couldn't do what she asked. So I walked and dropped off the invoices to accounting when I bumped into Lois. She brought up invoices and I sternly looked at her and said, Pamela is the only one in our department that Lois is allowed to talk to about our budget and invoices. Lois saw the suspiciously thick file folder on her desk, gave a firm nod and lovingly kicked me out of her office. Within the week, Pamela was fired. From what I understand, she's been continually job hopping for the past few years. The CEO and HR brought me in to personally apologize for everything I went through and gave me a paid one week vacation to take at my discretion. Given other issues with this business, I left after another year. Which brings me to today. I am once again a manager for sales and marketing. I have a wonderful boss, Mike, who trusts my business decisions and backs me up on practically everything. We're hiring for my team for me to solely manage and direct. Today, I looked through the applicants and found Pamela's resume sitting among dozens of others. I stared at her name, wondering how many other people share her name. Upon review, yep, it's her. She definitely fell down the corporate ladder with VP of our old company being the highest title she earned. And to no surprise, she embellished her achievements, claiming the work that I managed as her own and claimed that she generated an 87% sales growth during the holiday season at our previous company. As a people pleaser who firmly believes in giving everyone a chance, it has never been so satisfying to click disqualified. One thing that I will mention that maybe a lot of you are thinking right now is, wouldn't it have been better from OP's perspective, I guess more rewarding to have her walk into the interview room and you OP just be there? sat across the table knowing full well this is the same pamela and just seeing her reaction knowing in that one moment that she is never ever going to get that job and is completely wasting her time however i will put up on screen right now what op replied to that to those suggesting that i interview her to see her reaction i would have loved to see her face as she walked in but i felt it would have risked my boss's trust in my decision making ability i understand that i do understand that because yeah you don't want to kind of sacrifice or risk your own job while messing with pamela as much as i'm sure you want to however couldn't you have just done the interview anyway and then just secretly said no i don't really like her although again yeah thinking about it you do risk pamela saying i know you you know it, it could potentially put your job in jeopardy one last thing that op did say though is maybe i'll send a personally written rejection email that you definitely have to do it's it's without a doubt you just have to do it get it done now for our final story of revenge in this episode i left behind a dead man's switch in the company workflow when i sensed i was about to be bullied into quitting i started working in logistics at a company that builds things that was just as covid was starting actually when I started, we were five people in the team, but one of the guys quit soon after. This is important because it was a very good insight into how my department operates when they don't need or want a certain someone around. They won't outright fire you since then they have to pay you severance, but instead they will bully you into quitting. I saw pretty much the whole package, excluding them from meetings and important events, putting them down in public, lecturing them, never noticing good work, but always making sure that everybody knows about work that is poorly done. Drowning someone in work and then berating them when they inevitably can't keep up. It was outright childish at times. I didn't register it at the time, but it was a really valuable lesson for later. I was put in charge of managing our overseas suppliers, among other things. About half of our material came from overseas, most of that from China. While it seems like a big task for someone new, it wasn't done out of malice. Genuinely, everyone believed we were going to get a guy in China for the Chinese supplies, then I'd be left with a handful of others. It seemed fair, but we never got that guy for China, and I was left with all overseas suppliers. Another important thing is that just in this project, the company had decided to change the workflow for overseas suppliers. This is because due to COVID, the price of shipping containers had exploded. To explain it as simply as possible, Previously, the suppliers were responsible for filling our containers and bringing them to the harbor. We were responsible for picking them up from the harbor and bringing them to us. However, due to demand and many other things, sometimes we just needed two or three pallets of parts where a dozen or more could fit inside a container. So we were shipping a lot of air. 
The new workflow would have the suppliers bring the parts to an external warehouse, one in the US, one in China. Then we would load them into containers to get the containers as full as possible and then bring them to the harbor and then into our plants. This way, we needed to rent far fewer containers. This complicated things because it erased the direct contact from us to the suppliers. And there was no official method of how we were going to keep in contact with suppliers, telling them how many parts we need, how to package them, if there were any changes requested, etc. During that time, I was left mostly alone to deal with it. And I set up a system with Excel. It was mostly manual, rather simple, but it worked well. It worked so well that one of the suits even chatted with me about it for a bit, since he wanted to make it a standard in future projects. And also, this is very important. I was the only person who actually knew all our overseas suppliers and their contacts. Some of you might be able to tell where this story is going already. So during that entire time, nobody had actually bothered to ask me to explain to them how my system worked and where I kept track of all the supplier contacts. All of this data was hidden on like slide 800 of some Excel file that I'd saved in a folder titled parts pictures, which was otherwise filled with pictures of parts. Now moving forward, as COVID began to die down, the department for whatever reason decided they didn't need me anymore. I have theories, but nothing certain, so I'll just leave it at that. I pretty much saw precisely the same thing go down as I'd seen with that one guy who had left shortly after I started. All the bullying. I thought to myself at first that if I pull through and keep doing a good job, and I believe I did a good job, they'd eventually cool down. But they didn't. After two months of that, I said screw it and decided to just sit out and endure until the Christmas bonus we get every year and then hand in my notice. And also, I just delayed teaching anyone how my system worked until I was gone. And that is pretty much how it happened. So for my own future employment, I actually lucked out. One of the local suppliers I was managing had a really chill guy as managing director. I gave him a call, explained that I was about to be unemployed, and I asked if they needed staff. He then called me into an interview. We talked about anime for an hour, while his HR lady looked confused about what a attack on Titan was. And he told me I can come in the moment I'm done with my then or current job. So back on topic, a month into working at my new job, I got a call from my old job, the department manager. To his credit, he was always a reasonable guy. He told me in plain words that they have no idea where the frick to even start with the Chinese supplies. He then offered me my old job back with a very respectable pay increase. I explained that I already had a new job though. Two days later, I got another call where the same manager offered me many times my monthly salary just to come in for one week and instruct my old team in how my process functioned, introduce them to all the contacts, etc. I told him I refused because of the way I'd been treated by them when I worked there. He said that he understood and wished me luck at my new job and hung up. The reason I'm writing this story now? Well, this week, I randomly got in touch with some of the people in the transport department from my old job. They mentioned that in the now 10 months since I left, the logistics department racked up eight figure losses due to wrong deliveries, over and under deliveries, outdated parts, some suppliers canceling their contracts and new suppliers needing to be sourced, etc. And all the blame for that fell on my old team. My new job is fine. It's not the best job, but I get to travel a lot and get nice bonuses for it. My boss isn't around much since he's married. I do sometimes regret not taking that offer for a week as an instructor. Yeah, you see that right there is how you know how we can all have it completely and utterly confirmed that OP was so badly treated. When you're offered a fee, a one-off fee for one week of work that is like, I don't know how many times a monthly salary or your monthly salary that you used to have there and you still don't take it, that just shows how badly you must have been treated to say, you know what, I don't even care about any money at this point. I refuse to help out my ex-company in any way, shape or form, even if it's for millions and millions of dollars. I mean, yeah. Probably now you're looking back and thinking, oh, I could have done with that money. It was quite a lot for just a week of work, telling people things that I already knew. But you know what? Principle is principle. And honestly, I kind of rate it. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm, I'm not sure I could have done the same if I was offered that much money just to do something that was that simple. Even if I hated everything about a company, oh, I'd be tempted. But yeah, honestly, once again, I have to say fair play to you for not doing it. And good revenge. You didn't even really do anything necessarily. You just refused to take loads of money and ended up costing them eight 
figures. I mean, that is insane. That could be $99 million. Who knows? Stepdad cheats on my mum, so we get revenge. I moved in with my mum after her marriage of 25 years with my bio dad was ended. He was a manipulative jerk, but that's another story. Shortly after the divorce, my mum introduced me to her boyfriend at the time, Chris. Now, my mum worked as a correctionals officer at the county jail. The boyfriend was a former inmate, in for a DUI. That should have been the first red flag, but my mum was grieving a long marriage, and I didn't want to push the subject. Chris seemed to make her happy, and that was enough for me. Me, my bro, and my sis all moved in with my mum and Chris, and we seemed to get along okay. Chris and I bonded a bit over our love of video games, and all seemed well. That is until 2017. Due to Chris's prior DUI, he had to go in regularly for probationary checkups at the courthouse. One day, he didn't return, and we all got a little worried. We then received a phone call from him from Texas. Turns out, when he arrived at the courthouse that day, he was jumped by the FBI. His family from Texas was implicated on a number of gang and drug-related crimes, and due to a situation where he was in a vehicle during a drug handoff, he was on the hook as well. He ended up agreeing to testify against his family members in exchange for a shorter sentence, and he was allowed to be out of prison before the trial. Soon after, the drinking started. Now, obviously because of his DUI, Chris was clearly no stranger to drinking. He began to drink more and more to the point where he was consuming half a 24 pack of beer a day. Chris was a mean drunk. He regularly started fights when wasted and while they never got physical, he wasn't exactly kind with his words. My mum enabled his behavior for several years, saying the stress was getting to him from work and from the upcoming trial. Finally, after several years, my mum had had enough. Chris came home extremely drunk one night and my mum confronted him. She asked if he'd been drinking and when he didn't deny it, she kicked him out. He went to live with a friend temporarily. The next morning, mum asked us to help gather a few of his essentials so that he didn't have to re-enter the home until he was sober. While we were gathering his things, we heard a knock at the front door. We opened it to find Betty, one of Chris's co-workers and someone I went to high school with. She told my mum she had something important to share. After sitting my mum down and telling her not to share where she got the info from, Betty told my mum about how Chris was cheating on my mum with Darla. How he regularly had Darla perform sexual acts in and around his workplace. How Betty had caught them and how Chris told her that if she ever told my mum, he'd fire her. He was the store manager. And finally, how Darla was pregnant. My mum was angry. After the initial shock wore off, she told us to round up all of Chris's things and to dump them outside. We took everything of his out of the house and tossed it all in the alley behind our house. Chris had no reason or ability to return to the house. It was rented with only my mum on the paperwork, so no issues there. In the meantime, she called and confronted him. He confessed to the entire affair and that he was happy Darla was pregnant because that meant he'd finally have a child of his own. Mum refused to have more kids. We three were massive strains on her body. She likely wouldn't survive anymore. He refused to apologize for any of his actions. My mum arranged for him to collect his items from the alley with an officer present, and he left our lives. So now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the revenge. Now, my mum clearly wanted to dust her hands of him and move on. She was already quite emotional from the whole ordeal and wanted nothing more from him. But my sister, brother, and I had other ideas. First, we called his workplace. DQ operates as an independently owned franchise, and the owner of this branch owns several branches in the area. He was also a good friend. We informed him of the sexual acts being performed on the premises, and he went through the processes of getting Chris booted from his position and barred him from any of the branches in the area. Funnily, Betty got his position after he left and now runs a tight and clean ship. Chris no longer had a job or a place to live and so went to live with Darla in a town about an hour away. We found out that he started working at another DQ in that town and informed the owner of that location of the situation. It took significantly longer due to there being no current indecent actions occurring there, but eventually he lost that job too. Soon after, Chris began driving around our neighborhood, seemingly stalking my mum and our family, probably because of his job loss. Now, due to the whole situation in Texas, he never had his probation lifted for his DUI and thus still did not have a license. He never had to drive when he lived with us, since work was local and we could drive him as needed, but here he was, clearly driving around by himself when he shouldn't be. 
We contacted the police and informed them about Darla's vehicle in our neighborhood and that we believed Chris was driving it without a license. We told them to pull over the vehicle next time they see it as it would likely be Chris driving again. Sure enough, a few weeks later, we were told that Chris indeed was pulled over and sent back to the local jail for driving without a license and while intoxicated. The police also did a search of the home he was staying at and found several guns at the premises. Since he was a felon, he was not legally allowed to have weaponry on the premises, meaning there was more jail time tacked on. By the time his jail time had finished, it was just in time for him to be sent back to incarceration in Texas for the trial. Chris's son was born while Chris was in prison. Darla evidently realized what an absolute butt Chris was and cut ties with him while he was in prison. During his prison time, Chris started sending tons of letters to my mom, stating how sorry he was, pleading to take him back, and ranting about how it wasn't his fault. This was all in the same letter, mind you. Mum burnt every one of them. We moved on, moving out of states. Chris evidently got out of prison some years ago and now lives in Kansas, struggling and fighting child support, which Darla sued him for. Mum now has a new boyfriend, who treats her right and cares a lot more than Chris ever did. My brother and sister moved on and out and I still live with mum, assisting her with the newly purchased home that we've been renovating. Life's looking okay. I was reminded of this story by a chat with a co-worker about cheetahs and I thought to post it here for others to enjoy. Well, to be honest with you guys, that the first thing that kind of springs to mind or the first reaction I have after, after finishing that story is, wow, Chris was driving around your neighborhood in Darla's car under the influence and with a gun probably as well that, that is extremely scary and i'm kind of well i don't know i, I kind of want to say that it's lucky that you guys weren't affected or harmed or that he didn't find you first I, I don't know what else he could have been doing doing that other than trying to look for you and get his own revenge that sounds terrifying so look great revenge and all but genuinely i, I think that could have gone so much worse wow like Look, I'm all for good revenge stories, but by tracking him down and getting him fired again, which, uh, yeah, I can't argue, is great revenge in isolation. That made him come back to the neighborhood and look for you guys, right? You know, and we know what he's like, as I've just said, driving under the influence with a weapon. So, yeah, like good revenge, but also that could have been a really, really tragic ending. So I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that. Maybe that revenge went too far. Obviously, in the end, it was fine and it was good revenge but think of the potential consequences what do you guys think about that sometimes does this revenge go too far would it have been fine just you know making him lose his job in the neighborhood you're in and by the time he's in kansas and stuff just just leave him to it that's enough because again you don't want to damage someone to such an extent that they then have nothing to lose anymore because i think that's what has kind of happened here let me know in the comments down below that is a it's a controversial one but yeah, I reckon that might have been a bit too far just for your own safety. When your racket with the local cops bites you in the butt internationally. This happened a few years ago when I was serving overseas with the US military. The location I was at was in a poorer area. There's a fair number of panhandlers, a lot of petty crime, and just people doing stupid stuff. Well, one racket that goes on in this area, and apparently in other areas of the country too, is the local cops incentivize reporting vehicles without a date inspection sticker. Apparently, they give these people access to the inspection database if they think the sticker is fake or stolen, which actually does happen. If you drive a motorcycle, one of the things they tell you when you in process is to keep the sticker in your wallet and not on the vehicle or else it'll just get peeled off. Anyway, what these people will do if they find a car with an out of date sticker or if they run the plates and find it's out of date, they'll jimmy the door open, steal every single thing out of the car and leave a note that they've taken it to the police station. The idea is that you show up at the police station to get your stuff and they force you to pay the fine for an overdue sticker and then give you a deadline for an inspection or else you'll get another fine. Well, I came out to my car one morning and lo and behold, there was a note on my seat saying that all my stuff was at the local police station because my inspection sticker was fake and I had to go and get it. Now, not only am I late for work, my kid's also going to be late for school because there's no bus and I have to drive her every morning on my way. Also, my inspection sticker is not out of date, so I've got no idea what's going on. Now, here's the thing that was extremely problematic. I put my passport and my wife and kids in the glove box because I was taking them to the base to get some paperwork done. I was also going to grab some paperwork for my wife to apply for a new passport because hers had expired. I'm very forgetful, so I put them in the night before and made sure the car was locked. 
Yeah, dumb mistake. Anyway, I get to the station, ask them what the heck is going on. And then when I have them look at the inspection documents that the guy had taken, which clearly stated the car had been inspected and was current, they apologized and told me they'd give me my things back and I had to wait there for a second. I asked to file a police report for theft, but they looked at me like I had three heads and told me nothing was stolen, even though somebody broke into my car and took my things. This is when a light bulb went off in my head, and this might fall into the unethical category. The guy had taken official US passports, which might be a problem, but probably nothing would come of it since they were turned right into the police. However, I asked him where my wife's passport was. They told me that whatever is there is there. I said I needed a police report because I needed to contact the US embassy about a stolen passport and the fact that this police station would know exactly who the person was that stole it because they had dropped off my things that morning. I've never seen someone's attitude change as quickly as that cop's attitude changed. He tried to talk me out of filing a police report, but I was pretty insistent. So I went ahead with the report and then I did contact the embassy and reported the passport stolen and gave them all the information of the police station. And when I got the police report, I emailed it to them as well. I wound up getting a free passport out of it for my trouble. The embassy told me they were going to handle it. And from what I heard, the person who broke into my car actually got arrested and fined and was looking at additional charges because he stole foreign documents. I really would have liked to be a fly on the wall when one of the local cops rolled into wherever he was and told him to come with them. I don't feel bad at all. Hopefully the dude learned his lesson and I didn't have any further issues until I went back home. Okay, guys, look, I'll be completely honest with you. I don't really understand what's just happened there. Um, I, it's not often that this happens, I'll be honest, because a lot of these stories are pretty self-explanatory and the, the revenge is, is, you know, it's kind of makes sense or it, it's obvious. I don't get it. Why is the fact that, I don't know, maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree, but for, from my point of view, something is awry or something is unethical because op's wife's passport has already expired i just don't get it right I, I don't understand so what happens is they take they take all the stuff hand it to the police then you go to the police to get it back and then they say actually you need a, a date of inspection or whatever on your car uh pay for that now so if you get a fine you know obviously a bit backwards but yeah that's that's i guess some, some sort of racketeering with with the local cops However, what is it about OP asking where his wife's passport was that, that made this into some form of revenge? What's the difference, I guess I'm trying to say, between his passport and their child's passport being taken and his wife's expired passport being taken? Surely taking any passport at all is illegal or, or handing a passport in unless he's saying or claiming that his wife's passport wasn't expired. Pretty much, guys, get in the comments down below i don't really know i think i'm missing something here i've looked through the comments and no one has even mentioned it so i'm not entirely sure but you know maybe you let me know in the comments i have another think but that's my initial reaction i don't know what's happened look i get the fact that these are us passports and maybe that is the the thing that's illegal here however i don't understand why op has specifically referenced his wife's passport it's got to be it's got to be to do with the fact that it's expired in, in some regard or i don't know i'm missing something perhaps or something's missing from the story but again guys comment down below because uh yeah i'm not entirely sure but an interesting one nonetheless deliberately deplete my prepaid phone balance you will pay for it 1000 times over i went to middle school in the early 2010s right before smartphones really took off i got my first phone right before starting sixth grade it was a slide phone with a pay-as-you-go plan that cost 10 cents per minute for calls and per text message sent or received Worse yet, sending or receiving photos cost 25 cents each. It was very expensive, and my parents only gave me $100 a year for this. If I exceeded that amount, I had to cover the rest with my limited birthday and Christmas money that I had. Fortunately, most of my friends were good about helping me preserve the balance. They would call and I'd let the call drop, but immediately call back on a landline so it wouldn't count as a call, and they'd email me or message me on Skype for most things. Everything was good until Derek joined the group in 7th grade. At first, we thought he was funny, but we quickly got fed up with him as he was very unpleasant and exhibited many antisocial behaviours. He started drama within the friend group and also caused issues between us and other kids outside of the group. He was manipulative and always played the victim when others rightfully called him out on his trash and he knew how to charm parents so getting rid of him was easier said than done 
He was the one friend who didn't respect my phone situation He very frequently texted me dumb memes Even though I told him multiple times to just email or skype them to me instead Since picture text messages cost 25 cents each for me Unfortunately, blocking phone numbers was a feature that was unavailable for this pay-as-you-go plan So there was nothing that I could do as he spammed my phone One day he got mad at me for some reason and spammed my phone with memes He must have sent me over a hundred lolcats over text He kept sending them until I lost service since my phone balance was depleted I'd lost the $40 remaining in my account as a result I was extremely angry and demanded that he pay me the $40 he had cost me And he refused and said it wasn't his problem I got home from school really upset and told my dad about the situation Expecting him to go and tear Derek's mother a new one and demand the money But my dad said that it wasn't worth the battle I even asked him about a small claims court But he said that not all battles are worth fighting and that the effort wasn't worth $40 He took me to the carrier store and loaded $50 onto the phone The carrier changed my phone number and they managed to block Derek's number They'd initially said that blocking phone numbers wasn't possible with this plan But my dad insisted and would not leave the store until they did it I was extremely paranoid about my phone number being leaked and other kids spamming it to screw with me Fortunately, my parents got iPhones that summer and got me one too And the new family plan had an unlimited text plan Nonetheless, I was still angry at the $40 he essentially stole from me out of malice Fortunately, not too long after, there was a big blowout between Derek and the rest of the friend group at the end of the school year And we permanently kicked him out of the group He was an outcast the following year in 8th grade Nobody was tolerating his trash anymore and he changed schools the year after and we never heard from him again Fast forward to a few years ago I was back home for a few months between graduating college and starting a new job on the other side of the country I went out to some garage sales one saturday morning and I ended up at derek's house I recognized his mother, but I don't think she recognized me. I guess glasses and a beard is all you need I noticed some pokemon napkins out for sale and when I picked them up to look at them Derek's mum said that her son had been obsessed with Pokemon for his whole life and that she was tired of Pokemon stuff occupying her home for so many years. I said that these napkins were for my younger cousin who was really into Pokemon and I asked if she had any more Pokemon stuff. She said she didn't know that people were still into that and that there were a few boxes in the attic with her son's old stuff. She actually took me inside the house which I never imagined I'd set foot inside ever again and let me climb up the attic ladder and take down several large boxes to look through. The first one had Christmas ornaments in it and other junk, but I freaked out inside when she opened a box jam-packed with Pokemon video games in the original boxes, though I kept my cool on the outside. The whole reason I had agreed to go inside in the first place was because I was holding out hope of this exact scenario happening. See, I knew Derek was obsessed with Pokemon, Our friend group liked Pokemon back in the day, even when other kids thought it wasn't cool. But Derek was on a whole different level. He bragged about his collection all the time. At the time, he had every single main series game in the original box and in mint condition, as he always had to add in. I went to his house once and he was showing me his collection. He yelled at me for touching one of the games. Nobody was allowed to do that except him. He had many older Nintendo games in excellent condition, but Pokemon was his favorite. He had had a couple of incidents with his mum damaging or throwing away his things, not out of malice, but just ignorance, as she didn't think the games or collectibles had any value. Fast forward into the present day, I was thinking about this when I asked his mother if she had any other Pokemon stuff, so she ended up bringing out the mother load. We opened all of the boxes that she had me bring down. Within the boxes, there was the beloved collection of Pokemon games, all very well preserved, as well as several Nintendo consoles hundreds of games, two dozen binders full of Pokemon cards, and there was also a box of many Lego sets with the original boxes and everything with many old Star Wars sets. When I saw Django Fett, I knew I struck gold. I told her that I liked old Legos as well, and I asked her how much for the five boxes of games, cards, and Lego sets. And she thought for a second and said, $100 a box or $400 for all five? I told her I'd take it all and I hauled ass to get to an ATM. I loaded the five boxes into my dad's truck and immediately drove home. I knew there was potentially tens of thousands of dollars of goods here. This was the score of a lifetime and I finally felt vindicated for the $40 that Derek had taken from me all those years ago. I ended up giving all the stuff to my uncle who is a hobbyist eBay reseller. He offered to sell it all. 
he was willing to go through the effort and sell everything individually. And despite my insistence, he said that he wouldn't take more than a 10% cut of the profits after all fees and taxes. We went through and logged every single item along with the estimated value and the total of the whole lot was about $40,000. Oh my goodness me. 40,000 was a poetic number since this was a thousand times the value of what Derek stole from me all those years ago. Wow. Now the title actually makes literal sense. Deliberately deplete my prepaid phone balance. You will pay for it 1,000 times over. Literally. Oh, that is so good. My uncle sold most of the lot before the end of the summer and ended up writing me a check, though it was considerably less than $40,000, but it was still a life-changing amount of money for me. I was able to pay off my remaining student loans and put the rest towards a down payment on a new car. That is an unbelievable story. Now that is a glorious, glorious story of revenge. As I said at the end there, I was not expecting the title to be so literal. That is phenomenal. I've got to say... First of all, that initial plan that you're on with your phone is an absolute disgrace. Uh, secondly, Derek is a disgrace for abusing that plan, knowing full well it was costing you that much. I mean, back in the day, some of you are probably too young to remember this now, but, but the oldies among you, the more, the more mature, I guess. I'd include myself in this. Back in the day, you know, we used to have absolutely disgraceful phone contracts. I remember like you'd text another country and it would cost you like 50p for me in the UK per text. I remember one time I was texting someone in Switzerland, had no idea about this. Then my dad had the bill and, and, and just said, Jack, um, why do I have this unbelievably large charge on your latest phone bill? Who have you been texting? And I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, I did not realize that. But at least that time, it was my own fault, or, or I guess my own lack of lack of knowing. Whereas this time, someone knowing that you're going to have to pay a lot of money for their actions, that is very, very poor. And it makes this justice and this revenge so, so sweet. Great stuff. Obviously, his mum is none the wiser about the true value of, of Pokemon and, and cards and everything related to the game these days, especially in, in original condition and, and in good nick. But wow, $40,000 or even anything close to that. That is insane love it now for our second story of revenge you stole from me i can do much worse i'm currently traveling through europe and i just got robbed by one of my hostel roommates here's how it all started first i arrived at the hostel and after checking in i realized that the latch on my locker was broken i had a padlock but since the latch was broken i had no way to actually lock my locker i went and reported this to the reception and they said they would get maintenance to check it out I'm over a month into my Europe trip and I've had great roommates so far. So despite the locker still not locking, I figured it wouldn't be so bad. On the second day, I left the hostel at around 11 a.m. and didn't return until around 6 p.m. When I got back, I instantly noticed my stuff had been gone through since zippers were left open, Ziploc bags unzipped and other stuff misplaced. I quickly go through my stuff to check if anything was stolen. Everything was still there. However, when I checked my wallet, it was a different story. In my wallet, I had Brazilian reyes and euros. And what a coincidence, all my euros were gone, but my Brazilian reyes were still there. Luckily, I only lost around 100 euros because I had another compartment in my bag where I had much more cash. I quickly went to reception and reported the incident, and the staff took the matter very seriously. But since it was cash, it was basically impossible for me to get that money back. I had my suspicions on who the culprit was because my other roommates have mentioned having problems with this one guy, we'll call Bob, for the past week. He was extremely rude, would come home drunk every night, starts drinking at 10 a.m., pees all over the toilet seat, left water trails all throughout the dorm area, smoked in the room, and was all around just a menace. I was also pretty close with the others, so it was pretty easy to rule them out as I didn't think they'd steal from me. For clarification, the dorm was a six bed, so there was me and five other roommates. After having my cash robbed, I knew I wasn't going to leave without having my locker locked. So me and one of my roommates helped me find a way to lock it, and we found that if we lift up the locker, we were able to line it up with a part of the bed where we could stick a lock through. Then me and the three other roommates set a trap by placing a five euro bill under a pillow positioned it in a place where it's hidden but still obviously visible. We then go down and hang around for a bit. When we get back, Bob is laying face down in his top bunk bed and there is a random person on the bed under mine. I am a top bunk bed across the room from Bob. Originally, I thought that the random guy was one of Bob's friends, but it turns out that the fourth roommate checked out and the random guy was new. When we get back, you guessed it, the five euro bill was missing, but that's not all. 
I went to open my locker and my keys weren't working on my padlock. I then realized that a broken piece of a key was in my padlock. At this point, I was able to rule out any potential cleaning staff stealing from me. And if it wasn't obvious enough, I knew it was Bob. At this point, we're all talking about the situation and I look over at Bob. He is pretending to sleep face down in his bed. His head was slightly turned so he could look down onto the situation when he opened his eyes. At this point, I went down to the reception and after I told the manager this, combined with everything else that we already told him, it was finally enough reasoning for them to be able to kick him out. So one of the staff members comes up and walks up to the sleeping Bob and asks to talk with him outside of the room. He pretends to wake up and immediately says he didn't do anything. After several back and forth between the two, he finally complies. At this point, my nuclear revenge occurs. While he's out of the room, I realize that I had a split second to get revenge before Bob gets kicked out and I never see him again. I realized there was no way I was going to get the cash back, so I counted it as a loss and began looking for ways to get even. On his bed, he had his laptop, which was plugged in and charging. I grabbed it, opened it, and laid the screen side down. I then held the bottom side in place and began pulling the screen part upwards until I heard it snap. That's right, I snapped his laptop in half. But that's not all, we're just getting started. I looked through the rest of his stuff. He also didn't use a lock and half of his belongings were spread across the entire dorm. This man was a mess. I looked through his stuff and I'm able to find one of those card wallets in the back pocket of his pants. Unfortunately, no cash. However, there was a debit card and some other card. Not sure exactly what it was since I quickly glanced at it. I grabbed the cards and snapped both of them in half. I then slipped them back into his bag. I continued looking for stuff and found a nice looking watch and a toothbrush. I picked up the toothbrush, snapped it in half and pocketed the watch. At this point, one of the staff members walks in and asks us all to leave while Bob packs up his stuff. We all comply and my roommates head down to the lobby, but I had other plans. I left the hostel and walked 15 to 20 minutes to the river and you probably guess where this is going. I got his watch and chucked it from the bridge into the river. At this point, I began walking back and feel satisfied about the revenge I was able to get, but a little disappointed I couldn't see his reaction. Well, this is where things get interesting. As I'm walking back, I make a turn onto this long, narrow street where my hostel is, and out of all odds, I see him walking in the same direction towards our hostel. He doesn't notice I'm behind him, but I'm just awkwardly walking. As we're walking, he lets out a loud fuck and what sounded like a sigh of defeat. Eventually, he reaches our hostel, which is situated on the right of the direction we were walking. However, he doesn't turn right and instead turns left into this tiny gas station type of shop that is selling a bunch of wine, beers, and other alcohol. As I approach my hostel before turning right, I glance to the left and see him trying to buy some alcohol. He doesn't notice me, so I turn my head and continue walking to the right into our hostel. Inside, at the front of our hostel, are these long stairs where you walk straight for a while. Then, once you reach the top, you do a full 180 and climb the rest of the steps to reach the second floor. As I reach the first step of the stairs, I take another glance behind me. And not to sound cliche, but just like a movie, Bob is standing outside of the shop, staring at me with a blank stare and a look of defeat. I continue walking and as I'm about to do the 180 turn to climb the rest of the stairs, I give one last cold glance back at him. And at that moment, by the look on his face, he knows that I have effed up his stuff and I knew that he stole from me. It was the most satisfying thing ever and I'll gladly pay 100 euros to witness that moment again. P.S. Bob didn't report to the staff that his laptop or anything else was broken, which gives me further proof, if it wasn't obvious already, that it was him. Because if he really was innocent, then why wouldn't he bother to report any of this stuff? Okay, um, I don't really know how I feel about this one, to be honest, guys. Let me know in the comments down below. Whatever platform you're on, even on Spotify, you can comment now. You can, you can go into the Q&A section and leave your thoughts on this story. But for me personally, I just feel like this was way too much. I get it. You want some revenge. You're not going to be able to get that monetarily, I guess, or get like legal justice, perhaps, because it's not the craziest of, of things that the Bob's done and he's heading off anyways, got kicked out, blah, blah, blah. However, ultimately, stealing's bad. 
but he's stolen 100 euros from you. Yet you've gone and like destroyed his laptop, chucked a watch that, I mean, we have no idea how much a watch could be or indeed the sentimental value of that watch into a river. I mean, that's gone and potentially, yeah, kind of destroyed his life. Is that really like, is that justified? It just seems a little bit too harsh to me. Seems like he stole a bit of money from you and you said, oh, I'm going to just destroy everything then. It's a little bit too much if you ask me. Like, think about the ramifications for each crime. If Bob had been caught, what would have happened? Probably not much. I mean, yeah, it's illegal, but I don't think he would have been, you know, sent to jail or, or charged, really. Let's be honest. Maybe, maybe he would have been, but I don't really think so for 100 euros. Arrested, you know, put in a cell overnight maximum. Whereas for you, I mean, you're, you're, you're damaging and you're destroying potentially thousands of dollars worth, probably thousands of dollars worth of items. That is a lot more serious. That could come with an actual you know, sort of charge of, of theft or damage to property or whatever. I, I don't know about that. I would have just reported it to the police and left it there, really. Who knows what would have happened, but doing this much damage to someone else's stuff, I'm not sure I can get behind that. Like someone said below, should have taken the computer, wiped its memory entirely, and sold it at a pawn shop along with the watch. And then at least you get the money back instead of doing what you did, just destroying stuff, littering. I mean, the staff's gonna have to clear all that up probably as well. That probably would have been smarter, right? At least you get the, the money back for that sort of thing. I don't know. I just feel like it was kind of over the top. Not really required. But hey, maybe you guys, maybe you guys disagree in the comments. Let me know. Some like it hot. Reading a recent stolen food pro revenge reminded me that I too have a similar life experience to share. This is a true story. I had taken an R&D internship for a food company over the summer in Keokuk, the armpit of Iowa for those unfamiliar. For housing accommodations, the company had set me up in the local college dorm that was previously a retirement home. So it basically had individual rooms and bathrooms, but one large commercial kitchen. It was summer and the school didn't have a summer program, but allowed two full students to move in at the beginning of the summer. One was rarely there, but the other was constantly in the building and oftentimes had multiple friends over. Given the kitchen setup, we all stored our food there and it's a pretty no brainer that you shouldn't take from others but immediately, I had various food items going missing or being consumed regularly. Sodas, empty boxes of cereal put back on the shelf, etc. I initially posted a sign on the fridge to not eat others' food and also confronted both about having food go missing after the sign was up. But it didn't stop whomever from stealing my food, particularly when I'd head out of town for weekends. After complaining about the situation to my manager during my job, they helped formulate the perfect pro revenge. Given I was doing R&D work on food products, I was responsible for getting various ingredient samples to use for new recipes. My manager suggested that I get some capsaicin extracts for my research, even though we weren't doing anything in that realm for flavor profiles. Well, I found a company that had various Scoville unit extracts and I asked for a variety to see what worked best for our applications. Well, did they deliver with some small two ounce bottles of 50K, 100K, and 250k Scoville extracts. I ended up putting the 250k in a travel size spray bottle mixed with some water to help as a carrier. And wearing gloves and a mask borrowed from work, doctored the common food items being stolen with a liberal spraying of my mixture, mainly cereal, chips, crackers, jug of milk, and the lip or top of a few soda cans. For the snacks, I actually put some into a separate bag and left them open to dry before mixing back into the original packaging. I did this in a different dorm room in my wing as I know well enough how potent this can be in enclosed spaces. I did this right before another trip out of town. And when I returned, I found some of the chips and cereal and milk was missing, plus two of the three cans of soda that I doctored. I never got to see the result and no one ever said anything but none of my food went missing for the remaining month of my stay. I hope the experience was enlightening for them and they still remember the time they played with fire. Wow, that is some top tier revenge right there. I feel like this is a level up of other stories, similar stories that we've seen in the past before where Spice has been involved to stop people stealing food. This though is on another level, using your work as a, as a food technologist or, or whatever it is really that you, that you do to just <laughs> go above and beyond here. I mean, normally you'd say there's no real way that you could, you know, get inside a soda can and kind of infiltrate the liquid with some spicy sauce or whatever but by putting a little drop on on the rim genius it really is i would never have thought of that i will say though that it sounds as if your roommate went through quite a number of your things you know two of the three cans of soda have, have been taken does that mean that they had one thought 
oh, this is a little bit spicy as their mouth was burning. And then we're like, oh, let me just check this. I have another one as well. Oh, yeah, it's equally as spicy. Like, like how have... How have they done that? They obviously they are very stupid in general, but to go for two soda cans um, instead of just one. Overall, great revenge. Nobody likes a food thief. Dealt with. Love it. Now for our second pro revenge story of this episode. Revenge on a client who tried to throw me under the bus. I was pushing 40 and I'd learned a lot of lessons in more than 10 years of legal practice. But one of the most important lessons I learned was from an older lawyer that I worked for as a summer student after the second year of law school. A lawyer has three duties, he told me. First to himself, second to the court, and last the client. Always make sure you come first and the client comes last. The reason? Because clients will screw you, he said. They'll throw you under the bus without thinking twice. I should have stayed with this lawyer, but being young and an idiot, I had to go work downtown. And I'm still downtown now, but fortunately for me, I remembered this lesson. And it came in handy many years later when a client really did try to throw me under the bus. My client was this mid-sized company that did this and that and owned things here and there. Not big enough to be listed, but it did have a pretty sizable real estate portfolio. And one day, a building they owned burned to the ground. The company wanted to collect on the insurance, so they told Frank, a veteran salary man, to deal with it. Frank was close to 60 and thought he knew what he was doing. He didn't need me to help him with the insurance claim, he told me. He had everything under control. Besides, lawyers are expensive. Some guys really get off on not paying legal fees, and Frank was one of those guys who gloated over every penny that he managed not to pay to the lawyers. I dealt with Frank a lot, and he was always nickel and diming me. The insurer is going to screw you, I told Frank. It was only by luck that I even knew about the fire and the loss, because Frank could not ask for my help. He just let it slip one day. And since then, I'd kept on top of him, trying to get him to smarten up. I'd had to fight to get him to send me the proof of lost form to make sure he hadn't messed that up. Frank had screwed up a lot, and I wondered sometimes how he had a job. But the proof of loss was okay, at least, so that was one less thing to worry about. You don't know that, he said. I could tell he just wanted to get me off the phone. I'm paid to know when insurers are trying to screw my clients, I said. And the insurer is going to screw you. They've been stringing you along for ages with requests and questions and paperwork, but they aren't going to pay you, not unless you sue them. But Frank said he knew what he was doing, that it was all under control. And besides, he got along with the adjuster, so great. The limitation period expires in two weeks, I said. And once that two weeks pass, it will be too late to sue. The moment that limitation period expires, they will stop taking your calls. You'll get a final email saying, sorry, you're out of time, and that'll be that. Don't leave this till the last minute. Let me sue right now and you'll have the money in no time. Frank was like, sure, fine, whatever. Don't bother me, I got this, blah, blah, blah. And he got off the phone as soon as he could. I sent him the usual email with clear warnings and recommendations, which he ignored. I sent the email again and then again as the limitation period approached and again a couple of days before the deadline. I'm going to be at trial and you won't be able to reach me, my final email said. But you have to sue. You have other firms on your list, so pick one and sue. He didn't bother to reply, and I went off to do my trial. The trial lasted a couple of weeks, and no email from Frank. Then a month passed, and another month, still no email. I figured he must have sorted things out. Maybe Frank was right after all, I said to myself. And then my phone rang. It was Frank. Remember that fire insurance thing we spoke about? We'd only spoken about it like a dozen times. I figured he was calling up to gloat, so I cut to the chase. So they paid out. That's great, Frank. You were right. He asked me what I was talking about, and could he see a copy of the claim? What claim? I said. The claim against the insurer. You, you know, that, that, that claim. Does that mean the insurer didn't pay? I said. He hung up on me. And then a few minutes later, my computer dinged, and there was Frank's email. Talking about how he spoke, and he told me to sue and he was worried when I hadn't sent him a copy of the claim, so he was following up to get a copy of the claim. I emailed him back. I take it that the insurer didn't pay you, just like I told you they wouldn't, and now that the limitation period has expired, they told you to jump in the lake, leaving you with a loss in the millions. Is that it? I'd made a mistake by not going over Frank's head when he wouldn't listen to me, but if I'd gone over Frank's head, I never would have received another file from him, so I didn't. But that was then and this was now, so I CC'd Frank's boss and his boss's boss, plus I CC'd Bill, the client's in-house counsel. 
Bill acknowledged my email right away and called me later that day. Frank messed up, he said. We know that. He's an idiot. So what do we do? So his excuses didn't work? Nope. Bill explained that they'd summoned Frank to a boardroom, but his story didn't add up, given all the warnings I'd sent him. Besides, there would have been no reason for him to keep emailing the insurer if he told me to sue. Once the file goes to legal counsel, Frank's role was over. The company knew Frank was BSing them. So that's it then, Bill said. We just lost a couple of million bucks. It's okay, I said, explaining that when I realized that Frank was going to F up, I issued a claim against the insurer. Because I'd made Frank send me the proof of loss a while earlier, I had enough information that I could sue to preserve the cause of action. Not a great claim and short on details, but good enough. You sued without instructions, Bill said. Lawyers aren't supposed to sue without instructions because if you do that, you're personally liable for whatever cost the other side incurs. It's a big deal to sue without instructions. Yep, I said, I sued without instructions. I pulled up a copy of the claim and emailed it to him as we spoke. It's a little rough, I said, but we can always amend. Thank God, Bill said. Can I leave it with you? Of course he could. The insurer was a sitting duck and I knew I'd collect from them, no problem. A few days later, I got a call from another guy who worked for the client, a guy I didn't normally deal with. They had a situation and needed my help. I usually deal with Frank, I said. What's up? What was up was that Frank got called into another meeting and they handed him a one page letter and then he put his little office things in a box and security walked him past his co-workers to the elevator, escorting him downstairs to the parking lot. Bye bye, Frank. He was too old to get another job, or at least not a decent one. It was a life-changing event for Frank, but for me, he was just an anecdote, a cautionary tale that I tell young lawyers sometimes over beers, maybe too often because I'm getting on in years and I have my favorite stories. I wasn't trying to get revenge on Frank, not at all. And I would have felt a bit sorry for him if he hadn't been trying to throw me under the bus. But the guy who replaced him was great and never nickel and dimed me. So it was all good. Yeah, I mean, sorry. My my overarching conclusion from this story, guys, is that Frank is just an absolute clown. What is the point of of having a lawyer if you're not going to use them for situations like this? Yeah, fine. I get it. Lawyer fees are expensive. Sure. But when a building is burned down and it's kind of on a knife edge as to whether you can get the payout money from your insurer or not, surely you say, okay, when it's this severe, let's use our lawyer, whose, whose job it is, by the way, to make sure you get paid out. Don't stiff them like this. I mean, how much would it really cost anyway? As a percentage of the millions that the building costs, how much is a lawyer's fee really going to be? I mean, it's going to be minuscule, really, if you, if you see it like that. Just pay the money. You're so lucky. You're so, so lucky that OP has, has done this off their own back. You put themselves up, up and put themselves at risk. Because I don't think the majority of lawyers would have done this. And you would have been absolutely stiffed. I mean, yeah, look, you still lost your job, Frank. But it could have been so much worse. I just don't really get it. The more I think about it, the more confusing it is. Frank himself isn't even the one that's paying for the lawyer. It's not his business. He has bosses. Why is that? Is, is he then just going to his bosses and saying, guys, don't worry, I handled it myself. That lawyer that you pay for, don't worry, don't need him. It's just so dumb. Like if you're Frank's boss, you're probably going to be saying, okay, thanks, man. You've saved us a few thousand dollars here, but wh why do we employ this lawyer in the first place? Why is he our go-to guy? Because he knows what he's doing and on the whole saves or makes us money. Really, really dumb. Yeah, as I said, lucky that you kind of got away with this one, but yeah, Frank had to go. And that is the end of this one. So that means you have to go and hit the subscribe button. <sighs> there we go. I mean, come on, drop a like just for that. If you did enjoy this one, let me know in the comments down below. Like the video, subscribe and follow me on podcast platforms and here on YouTube if you are watching my beautiful face. And guys, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more Reddit stories.